Hey guys, this is Justin. In preparation for Halloween, I thought I would give you guys an extra spooky video. So I went through the archives, collected some of my favorite scary, disturbing content that I've made, and put it together for your enjoyment. As always, if you like these compilations, make sure to not only drop a like, but check the description, because if there's a video you don't want to watch, maybe you've already seen it, maybe you didn't like how my voice sounded two microphones ago, you can always skip ahead or even go backwards. Timestamps included. But let's get on with the content. Let's talk about the back rooms before examining this phenomenal new short film. This is going to be quite a process as I'm going to explain back rooms and liminal spaces, so if you're familiar with these concepts and don't want a retread, I'll put a timestamp up to where I'm talking about the short film. The idea of the back rooms first came from 4chan, and specifically a very short post on X, which I'll read in its entirety. If you're not careful and you no clip out of reality in the wrong areas, you'll end up in the back rooms where it's nothing but the stink of old moist carpet, the madness of mono yellow, the endless background noise of fluorescent lights at maximum humbuzz, and approximately 600 million square miles of randomly segmented empty rooms to be trapped in. God save you if you hear something wandering around nearby because it sure as hell has heard you. As you can probably tell by that brief post, the back rooms are described as sort of an adjacent reality to our own. No clip in the context of the post is in reference to video games where you can sometimes make it through walls or other obstacles you're not meant to and end up in weird places never meant for the player. Back rooms are tied very closely with the idea of liminal space. Liminal generally refers to the process of transition and specifically the idea of a threshold. Now the transition can mean a personal change but it can also mean the point where our perception becomes limited. Think of a boundary or or a border space. Often liminality, when used in psychology or sociology, is closely tied to feelings of, well, disorientation. I'll get to liminal spaces in a second because that's what this is really about, but the idea of liminality is very interesting on its own and helps understand the feelings that you might have when looking at some of the pictures we'll discuss in a second. For example, think about how strange it feels on the day of graduation or the night of prom when you're on that threshold of leaving a major point in your life, or that feeling when you know you're going to see someone for the last time, or the feeling of witnessing a major event, like if you were old enough for 9-11. Spaces are meant to be a physical representation of this idea of transition, oftentimes emptiness, abandonedness, something very distinct from creepy, at least when done properly. Now, given how popular liminal spaces are on the internet, this can be done to various effectiveness, but the best liminal spaces mix the unsettling with the familiar, and at least as I experience them, often call back in some strange way to childhood. And to me, it's not really surprising if you Google images of liminal spaces, you will see lots of strange or new elements that are introduced in childhood, but that feel definitely a little weird outside your normal comfort zone. Hotels, for example, hotel pools. A fairly common experience for a child, but one that takes you outside of your home and also, I think, your comfort level. You also have schools or malls at night, places that normally have one feeling transitioning to something completely different and new when people aren't there. And some of it is just also hard to explain, but there does seem to be a sort of understanding of what a liminal space should feel like, even if it's somewhat hard to describe. I think, strangely enough, really good examples of liminal spaces can be found in the original Halo game. That's both multiplayer and single player. I might talk about this in the future because I find it very interesting, but Halo single player has a very strange feel to it, especially in its quieter moments it can genuinely be a little unsettling, and I think that's partially because you're on this massive structure with almost nonsense geometry, but it is in this weird transition state. It's ancient, it's empty, its original caretakers are gone, it's very ambient with the massive skyboxes and whatnot, it just feels like you're somewhere off. I think that feeling can also be found if you play multiplayer, especially without anybody else, and just walk around the maps. It's definitely a strange experience, but let's get back to the idea of the back rooms and talk about the actual short film that we'll be discussing today. So the back rooms are an example of a liminal space. Not all liminal spaces are back rooms, but the back rooms are one example. I think the weird feeling from the back rooms probably comes from the fact that as children or maybe even adults, we've all been in strange office buildings or places that didn't make sense to us at the time. Or you go behind the counter to an office and you're just seeing this whole other world and it is very strange. I think that's what the back rooms really capture, especially with 
the weird mundane aspect of office life, the curtains, the buzzing lights, etc. Anyway, since the original creation of the back rooms on 4chan, there have been a variety of games, videos, and more all covering the back rooms and fleshing it out. Often they have very similar qualities. The back rooms are infinite. Once you accidentally find your way into them, there's no way out, and often there is some sort of beast behind the curtain. This is not a pleasant place to be. It's not a place where humans are meant to be. And as I mentioned, it's a place beyond all understanding. Moving now to the phenomenal short film by Kane Pixels, we can see that it's presented in this sort of VHS retro format, which for some reason fits this aesthetic so well. I kind of wonder whether that's because a lot of people who consume this type of content were growing up when VHSs were popular. I'd like to speak to some older people and ask them whether this aesthetic gives them the same sort of feeling. I think that could be interesting, but anyway, what's really well done about this short film is that it captures the endless and absurd nature of the back room so well. It's just repeated rooms, hallways, some which aren't even accessible, but which also plainly do not have any real function. Eventually, the cameraman finds some graffiti, which tells him not to move, and we get our first glimpse, or first really good glimpse, at the monster which inhabits the back rooms. To me, I find that the beast has always been the least interesting part of this creepypasta. It's one that I don't think hits on an emotional level or any sort of psychological level, other than the fact that it would be scary to be stuck in these back rooms with a terrifying monster, but I do really like the design in this short here. It doesn't make a sound of a predator, it's just like a wailing analog sound, which itself is even more disturbing. Anyway, fleeing, the cameraman continues through the back rooms, he finds several different room designs, and eventually comes out into what really reminds me, funny enough, of the map boarding action from Halo CE, massive corridors overlooking a space. I think one of the best parts about the back rooms as an idea is that it's attempting to give some sort of interesting backstory to strange feelings that we almost all felt. I think from that perspective, the back rooms work well, almost like a matrix analog. In the matrix, they have their own sort of back rooms, and I can imagine that maybe that's what the original poster on 4chan was intending for us to feel, and what this short film is intending for us to feel as well. The back rooms are a way to navigate our world in a very different way, or by a very different creature. They're somehow intrinsically connected to the real world, but also different. And at the very end, we do see that the camera no clips out through the back rooms into the real world, presumably without the cameraman, just as he enters at the beginning without any real explanation. The creature itself, we also get a look at at the very end, and it also feels like something out of a childhood. To me, it looks like the real life version of a glitch that would scare the hell out of you in an old N64 game or an old PlayStation game. Here's a little personal story to end the video off with before giving my final thoughts. When I was a kid, I had the mission impossible game for the N64. There was one level where you had to go into this, it was like a ballroom or a party, and there was a guy playing the piano. I doubt I'll ever be able to find a video or a reproduction of what happened ever, but the game glitched in a way that as a child, I just did not understand. Now, there's a simple explanation for this, and as an adult, I probably would have been frustrated, but as a child who only understood rigidity and thought that there was rules for everything that would always be followed, it was extremely creepy. The music didn't play properly. The man who played the piano wasn't in the position he should have been. He was moving strangely around the map. I don't even really remember what happened. All I remember is the feeling that I got, just that something was wrong. Sort of the same idea as the back rooms. There's some dark or strange undercurrent to the whole world you don't quite understand. To me, the monster is sort of a real life, in the video at least, version of those feelings, and that's why I think it works really well for the back rooms. So just in summary, this is a phenomenal Phenomenal short film by Kane Pixels. It's incredible what this individual meant to do. How he actually made this, I'm not sure. It seems like it is a mix between animation and maybe live action camera movements. Either way, really spot on. And to me, it manages to capture the spirit of the backrooms.
As many of you know, I find the idea of an unknown regions in the Star Wars galaxy to be incredibly interesting. There is this one portion of space that even in a galaxy full of trillions upon trillions of beings is largely unexplored and unknown. Various Star Wars books, including the Thrawn duology and the new canon Thrawn trilogy, have elevated this mystery by hinting at disturbing and unimaginable horrors waiting among the stars. Today I thought we'd take a look at some of the worst entities, beings, Beings, creatures, and species which find their home in the unknown regions. The first evil that comes to mind is one that's unfortunately quite ordinary in the Star Wars universe, and I speak of the Vagari, a civilization made up of interstellar slavers. The Vagari were a race which the Chiss, who served as an almost bright spot in the unknown regions, sometimes clashed with. The Chiss actually thought that the Vagari were extinct due to past conflicts, but in the post-Endor period it's discovered that the Vagari in fact still survived, and it simply went into hiding. As mentioned, the Vagari are frequently described as slavers, we're not exactly sure what they used the slaves for, whether they sold them or put them into service somehow. We do know, however, from the outbound flight, that slaves were kept on the outside of Vagari ships in small bubbles so that they could operate as a sort of shield. This was particularly effective if a race was trying to rescue those who were enslaved. They wouldn't want to fire on the Vagari lest they risk destroying those on board. As we see in the outbound flight, this would also work very well against beings like Jedi. A similar faction that you'd certainly want to avoid in the Unknown Regions was the Ibruchi. The Ibruchi were a violent race which often operated nomadically in the Unknown Regions as pirates trying to survive in the harsh areas of space they've inhabited for thousands of years. According to the Unknown Regions source book, the Ibruchi had their homeworld devastated by the Vagari, and somewhat ironically, given the fact that they were attacked by the Vagari, became interstellar slavers in their own right. The Ibruchi are an incredibly cold and pragmatic species. While they do enjoy inflicting pain onto others, they'll also, when possible, take hostages or even useful outsiders in as members of their pirate crew. They're so deadly, however, because they hunt the hyperspace lanes and frequently respond with overwhelming force to destroy and plunder those who travel alone. Like many in the Unknown Regions, they're a species completely devoid of kindness, of sympathy, and of weakness. Next, we're going to cover a species which I've discussed many times on this channel before, so feel free to skip through if you want. I'm referring to the Nal Nal. The Nal Nal is basically as close as Star Wars gets to having a flood-like species, although it appears simply to be gray ooze. The Nal Nal is actually a single, self-aware intelligence. The homeworld of the Nal Nal, or at least the place where they're most present, is a world known as Mug Fallow. There, the Nal Nal form entire oceans of gray fluid and take weird forms on the planet's surface. According to the Unknown Region Sourcebook, and I quote, it is clear that Nal Nal has malevolent intent its primary tactics of aggression, infecting other beings and spreading off-world inside their husks, do not appear to be based on any sort of survival instinct. Instead, it seems to thrive on the suffering of others. As that passage alludes to, the Nal Nal can take over the corpses of sentient beings, essentially hollowing them out with the gray fluid and then transmitting further to others. And this, alongside the central intelligence, is where the comparison to the Flood in Halo is most apt. However, instead of simply taking over over a being's nervous system, it literally hollows out the creature and replaces it with itself. The source book also alludes to a strange history of the Nal Nal, the fact that they may be from another dimension, that they have said to existed longer than any civilization in the galaxy, that they may have even caused the Celestials to leave and form the hyperspace barrier, which now prevents outside travel. Either way, it's rumored that Mug Follow is ringed by orbiting derelict ships from every era of spaceflight in the Star Wars universe. Being infected by the Nal Nal is not a pleasant experience. It's incredibly painful, and again, according to the guide, within 24 hours you are, and I quote, entirely filled with viscous pus. Not a very pleasant image there. The bodies then are often puppeted by the hive mind in a way that will cause pain to any who are in the immediate vicinity. Not just physical pain also, emotional pain as well. Moving on though, the next section I wanted to talk about is one of my favorite kind of minor factions in the Star Wars galaxy, and that is the Psy Rook. We first learn of the Psy Rook in the Truce at Bakura, where they, of course, attack the planet Bakura 
almost immediately after the Empire's defeat at the Battle of Endor. The Cyruk are essentially very powerful, well-muscled dinosaurs, but it's really their technology which is the most terrifying aspect of their dominion. The Cyruk use a technique known as Intechment, which essentially steals the life force or the energy of a living being, trapping it within a battle droid or some other mechanical construct. You can be captured by the Sea Rook, have your life force stolen, and essentially serve in a semi-conscious state as like a light bulb or a windshield wiper or something on a Sea Ruby ship, all while being in extreme pain. I've called this one of the worst fates in Star Wars, and really it is. As this is happening, and as you're experiencing this new form of life, the pain is so awful that many souls essentially scream themselves into insanity and have to be discarded. The Sea Ruby Imperium also has an incredibly powerful military, especially given the fact that if a planet is conquered, its inhabitants can be used to power more battle droids, essentially creating a slippery slope anytime an invasion begins. The Sea Ruby Imperium is very, very far from the galaxy's core, pretty much on the rim itself, if not in extragalactic space. The Sea Ruby were also beat down quite heavily by the New Republic and the Empire after Endor, but they still could expand and are an incredibly aggressive and dangerous alien race. I also wanted to briefly mention the navigational hazards of the Unknown Region. I covered this very recently, so I'm only going to be brief. Basically, travel through the Unknown Region is very difficult. Not only is that area of the galaxy less well mapped, but there's also a hyperspace disturbance which bisects the Unknown Region and can completely disrupt travel. There's also the rumor of far stranger entities. For example, the Unknown Region has been tied to the appearance of several ghost ships, and planets like Duras are said to perhaps even have been cursed by the dark side. Aside from that, much of the Unknown Regions is also inhospitable, but there are also other planets which have either not been discovered or which have very little sentient life, which could of course serve as a potential refuge for any who discover it. The final thing I want to mention is that Palpatine had a real interest in the Unknown Regions. He didn't really open that galaxy up to exploration to the same degree he did with other parts of space, but there's evidence in both Legends and Canon that the Unknown Regions was home to secret projects, shipyards, and facilities. Most famously, we have the Empire of the Hand. This was established by Palpatine, but more directly by Thrawn, and was a sort of combination of the Empire and the Chiss. It was an extraordinarily powerful force, as the Empire proper was declining, and was meant to serve not only as reinforcement, but also as a bulwark against galactic invaders or threats like the Yuuzhan Vong. Unlike the Chiss, they wouldn't have have shared the same policies of non-aggression and would have done anything if necessary to keep their presence secret. Deep in the bowels of Jabba's foul palace lies a secret almost too disturbing to utter. A secret that will change not only how you see Return of the Jedi, but Star Wars as a whole. Jabba's entourage was made up of hundreds of aliens. One in particular is the focus of today's video, and anyone who knows Jabba knows his fondness for jizz whaling one of the galaxy's most popular musical styles. He loved jizz so much that he hired a band as live-in entertainers. I'm talking, of course, about the wonderful Max Rebo Band. By the time of Return of the Jedi, the group was made up of 12 members, including, of course, Max Rebo himself. Personally, I prefer Droopy McCool, but Max was deservedly the star. As a kid, I didn't know Max's name. I just called him the Blue Elephant, like I think most of us did. I thought he was a cute little fella sitting behind a keyboard rocking out for a giant slug. Honestly, I wish I could go back to those childhood days, and it wasn't until much later that I discovered the horrifying truth. You see, those appendages that Max uses to play his keyboard aren't arms their legs. Toy companies and the writers of the old expanded universe realized that we weren't ready for the truth, so played to the fantasy that many of us believed, that Max was an ordinary, upright walking blue elephant who just happened to be sitting behind a keyboard. But as Pablo Hidalgo explains in the StarWars.com article getting to the bottom of Max Rebo, the original designers actually sculpted Max as sitting, as we can see in these grotesque pictures which show, and excuse my foul language, a but another horrifying image shows that Max is not behind a padded ledge on his keyboard, like I always assumed. He's actually sitting on a cushion, legs splayed out for the world to see, feet playing the keyboard. 
Once you realize this inescapable truth, it's never possible to look at Max, Return of the Jedi, or even Star Wars the same way ever again. Honestly, I don't think children should be exposed to this, and I'm very, very uncomfortable by the fact that the new canon doesn't even attempt to hide Max's strange body. New reference books have made clear that Ortolans only possess two limbs, and disturbing imagery has even made its way to non-canon comic books. The SCP Foundation is an organization which catalogs, secures, and studies thousands of beings, artifacts, phenomena, and more, many of which are extra-dimensional, extraterrestrial, or just beyond human understanding. SCP refers to the Foundation's three main mission objectives, to secure, to contain, and to protect. However, the initialism has a second meaning, special containment procedures, which are the methods used to keep the various things within the Foundation from escaping or causing damage. Today, we'll explore the basic lore of the SCP Foundation and take a closer look at four phenomena. Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to something a little bit different. We've never covered anything like the SCP Foundation on this channel. However, you guys have been asking me to do so since I started covering non-Star Wars content, and yesterday's vote was pretty clear. Now, there are several dedicated SCP lore channels on YouTube, so I thought it'd be fun if instead of doing a deep dive on a single SCP story, we took a more high-level approach, introducing the site from an out-of-universe perspective while also looking at the in-universe lore. At the end, we'll also take a closer look at four individual SCPs. Now, I'm not an expert on the SCP universe, I don't know every article, but I have spent many nights reading through the website, especially when I was an after-hour security guard during law school, which was pretty creepy. On a basic level, the FCP Foundation is essentially a collaborative wiki, where users are continuing continually adding new stories that fit within the universe. Individual wiki articles usually detail some manner of creature or phenomenon while also talking about the security procedures used to contain it. Due to the fact that individual entries are often disturbing, strange, or bizarre, the website is almost like a heavily curated creepypasta wiki. However, the foundation itself serves as a common element between these stories, making the whole thing a work of collaborative fiction with even an element of community-generated lore. In universe, the SCP Foundation does not have a real ongoing narrative besides that found within individual articles. That being said, individual SCPs often reference other pages, helping to sort of tie the universe together. What's more, most articles have several common features, including the use of redactions, eyewitness testimony, security protocols, object classification, and more. Often articles will have addendums, additions, or project tapes, which provide a sort of timeline based narrative. Before we dig deep into a few articles to show you guys what I mean, let's first take a look at some of the lore that does exist. The SCP Foundation is a global initiative with the ultimate goal of preventing humanity from slipping into the darkness from which we emerged. For this reason, although the Foundation is definitely cold and lives are often disposed without second thought, the SCP Foundation does have an ultimately positive goal. That being said, it's certainly not benevolent and the Foundation itself, as well as its employees, often engage in immoral and sometimes even evil behavior, though still dedicated to the protection of humanity. So here's the Foundation's mission statement. Operating clandestine and worldwide, the Foundation operates beyond jurisdiction, empowered and entrusted by every major national government with the task of containing anomalous objects, entity, and phenomena. These anomalies pose a significant threat to global security by threatening either physical physical or psychological harm. The Foundation operates to maintain normalcy so that worldwide civilian populations can live and go on with their daily lives without fear, mistrust, or doubt in 
their personal beliefs, and to maintain human independence from extraterrestrial, extra-dimensional, and other extra-normal influence. So the Foundation deals with anomalies and attempts to protect humanity from them, whether through containment, destruction, or at the very least understanding. Each anomaly is assigned a special containment procedure, i.e. how it must be handled in order to maintain safety. The anomalies are thus often referred to as SCP and a number, for example SCP-001. Many anomalies require little maintenance and some can even be left out in the public, while others can only be accessed by the highest level of SCP employees and must be secured, for example, underground within meters of concrete. The Foundation has dozens, if not hundreds of facilities, including some that are sub-ocean and at least one on the moon. SCPs are given a classification level. On one hand, we have safe objects, which present little risk of escape. On the other hand, we have Keter objects, which are both almost impossible to contain and represent a major threat to human life or sometimes the fabric of space or time. Notably, an object being safe does not mean that it's not dangerous, it just means that there's little risk of it escaping its containment. Access to objects is based on employee clearance level, which is ranked from 0 to 5, with level 5 employees having access to not only the most dangerous or difficult to contain SCPs, but also ones which can provide the most benefit, either in somehow counteracting another SCP or providing a tangible benefit to the user, for example, pills which heal all maladies. Additionally, employees are given roles, from field agent or scientist to expendable Class D personnel, who are often death row felons. To protect the facilities or neutralize rogue SCPs, dozens of task forces with the power of small armies have also been created. So that's the basic lore around the Foundation itself, but let's look at some specific anomalies as well as their SCPs. Again, their containment procedures. I've selected four, which I think give a good overview of some of the different types of anomalies contained by the Foundation. The ones I've selected are also not very complicated. Many SCPs are in video form or have pages of background information, which is a bit much for this video. Let's start with the first SCP ever created and probably the most famous, SCP-173. 173 is a creation of unknown origin made of rebar and concrete. The object appears stationary when gazed upon, but if not being looked at, will kill anyone in the vicinity, breaking their neck. Alongside that, the object inexplicably oozes feces and blood. The containment protocol requires that 173 be kept within a locked concrete box at all points, and if entry into the room is required, there are to be at least three employees making eye contact. For a single employee, even blinking or looking away for half a second would prove deadly. Next up is SCP-1733, which is probably my favorite of them all. On its face, 1733 is pretty simple. It's a DVR containing a digital recording of the 2010 NBA season opener between the Miami Heat and the Boston Celtics. The recording, however, doesn't contain the game as it actually happened. It diverges, at the beginning only in small ways, such as point differences. However, as the recording is watched and restarted, the players begin to develop an awareness of their existence, that the game has happened before. This first manifests in announcers developing a sense of intense deja vu and the players being able to adapt to opponent strategy, but as the tape is rewatched, things just get worse. By viewing 45, the players are unable to score on each other. By 51, serious fighting in the stands has occurred. As the arena realizes they can't escape, they attempt to knock down the doors before devolving into further hedonistic and violent acts. An unknown playback sees LeBron James and Paul Pierce ritualistically sacrificed. Eventually, the lights within the arena turn to a deep red color and any data after that point has been removed. Because the SCP is just a DVR, the containment process is pretty simple. It's locked away in a digital archive. However, Foundation members are also monitoring the internet to look for any mention of the tape. A similar SCP shows a speech given by Ronald Reagan, where he is slowly tortured and maimed while discussing suicide, child abuse, cannibalism, and more. 
As the speech goes on, he sometimes offers prophetic visions of the future, before eventually being brutally killed. Another commonly loved SCP is SCP-87, which is simply a stairway. To contain it, this strange stairway was disguised as a janitor's closet and closed off with an impenetrable door. So upon entering the staircase, one hears the cries of a child below them. However, the stairs descend seemingly indefinitely and are impossible to light. The Foundation has sent several teams to attempt to reach the bottom. The first descended for about 30 minutes before developing a real sense of unease. Soon after, they discovered a motionless human face, though lacking nostrils and pupils. The face, and presumably the body it was attached to, was aware of the worker and eventually jerked towards it, causing the subject to flee. The second expedition yielded similar results, though this time, upon exiting, the employee entered a catatonic state from which they did not awaken. The third subject managed to get even deeper, several hundred flights down, discovering a dark hole, kilometers deep, which itself seemed to be infinite. They were apparently killed by that creature who had been following them for some time. A fourth, likely more militarized expedition was launched, however, due to the results of this final exploration, no personnel are permitted access to the files. On a completely different note, SCP-294 is a coffee machine in a personnel break room. It is a source of seemingly unlimited liquids, dispensed upon a person inserting 50 cents and choosing what they'd like to receive. This includes every Thing from beer to liquid nitrogen. However, there is a dangerous potential here. A cup of joe, once expelled, not coffee, but a collection of blood and tissue from a worker named Joe. Other strange creations, including drinks which triggered memories or feelings, and even one which removed the leukemia from a patient, dispensing it in liquid form. There are actually many similarly helpful or at least neutral SCPs, which are typically guarded fairly heavily. Briefly, two others that I like are SCP-1562, an interdimensional slide which ejects the user into some sort of cave system where they're unable to even move, and 2624, which is about the ghost of friendly space dogs. I guess. Many anomalies are incredibly disturbing. They're everything from violent humanoids, to angry stars which are slowly approaching Earth, to phenomenon, ghosts, aliens, haunted objects, and even a rock, which makes any user holding it procrastinate. So, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream is set in an alternate history where the Cold War, instead of de-escalating into peace, transformed to a full-scale worldwide war. Because of the complexity of this war, at least three countries, the Chinese, the Russians, and the Americans, developed new, highly evolved supercomputers, the Allied Master Computers. These systems were built into the ground, were continually expanded and made more complex, but eventually surpassed even their makers. The machines began to connect to one another and gain sentience. At that point, they became known as the Aggressive Menace, but the self-aware machine instead referred to itself as Am as in, I think, therefore I am. After achieving sentience, Am launched a massive attack against the Earth, and all of humanity was seemingly wiped out, with the exception of five humans, and if we take the video game that came out later, also a small colony who survive on the moon, outside the reach of Am. The apocalypse seems to have been nearly instantaneous, and likely involved nuclear weapons, given that the surface of Earth is described as being melted. Why did Am attack? Well, we'll cover all of that later, but first, let's look at the horrific things and the suffering he inflicted on the five remaining humans left on Earth. These five were Benny, Gorister, Ellen, Nimdok, and Ted. It's unclear exactly how they are imprisoned. They're described as being within sort of the bowels of the machine, in hundreds of millions of kilometers of trenches and tunnels which Am has modified to inflict suffering, with places like the Cavern of Rats, the Country of the Blind, and the Path of Boiling Steam. However, given the absolute power that Am has over these five individuals, it's also possible that their imprisonment is more metaphysical than literal. Perhaps they're simply brains in a vat, or they're connected to a machine. 
or perhaps the beings have had their minds digitized in some way. Regardless, in what Ted calls 109 years after the apocalypse, although that number is based on measurements given by Am, the five humans remain alive, having not aged at all. Am is specifically keeping them alive. Although humans, for example, will feel the pain of hunger, they won't actually starve to death. Am routinely also inflicts damage onto them, bringing them extremely close to dying, but always keeping them from actually passing on and healing them. Here's a quote. Stomachs that were merely cauldrons of acid, bubbling and foaming, always shooting spears of silver-thin pain into our chests. It was the pain of the terminal ulcer, terminal cancer, terminal paresis. It was unending pain. However, Am also modified the humans. Ted had been psychologically broken, although he doesn't quite recognize it. Others like Benny have been dramatically modified, and Benny himself now resembles basically more of an ape than a man, while others have had drastic changes to their personality. It's unclear when these changes happened, whether it was all at once, but Am also sometimes inflicts permanent damage. One of the humans, for example, is blinded nearly instantaneously by the machine. Very bluntly put, Ted states that the machine masturbates and that they have to take it and die, basically stating that the machine gets extreme pleasure out of the horrors he inflicts on the living beings and that their only option is to continue going. By 109 years in, they're incredibly desperate. They'll do things like feeding on worms and filth just to simply try to satiate their hunger. Their narrative actually starts with the five humans on a journey through miles and miles of tunnels to try to find simply one can of food that they believe may be at a certain location. On this journey, they encounter a massive, indescribable, scuttling thing, which brings some of them, especially Ted, almost to madness. Later, they're buffeted by a massive hurricane which they then discover has been created by a gargantuan eagle being. A being so horrifying that Ted actually wonders if it was made from human mythology or perhaps just their greatest fear. On that note, Ted also reflects on the degree to which Am can break into their brains at will. Here's another quote. Am said it with the sliding cold horror of a razor blade slicing my eyeball. Am said it with the bubbling thickness of my lungs filled with phlegm, drowning me from within. Am said it with the shriek of babies being ground beneath blue hot rollers. Am said it with the taste of maggoty pork. Am touched me in every way I'd ever been touched and devised new ways at his leisure there inside my mind. In fact, they find out a month into the trek that the only food available is the giant godlike eagle, which Am says they can kill if they want to try. Obviously impossible. Am's power is further shown on the journey back. Ellen and Nimdok are sucked into the earth during an earthquake, seemingly killed, but returned by a chorus of angels, almost no worse for wear. Eventually though, on the journey back, as one of the humans sets on another, through sheer exhaustion and hunger, Ted realizes that the only way out, and the only way to even hurt the machine, is to kill each other. And acting quickly, he and Ellen are able to kill the other humans, stabbing them with pieces of ice. He also kills Ellen, however before he can kill himself, he is captured by Am, who is even more furious than before. And what's more, instead of now being able to spread his anger onto five beings, it's directed simply at Ted. Ted is transformed into essentially a semi-mobile, gelatinous mass. He has his full mental faculties, but almost no ability to move, he can't speak or see, and his perspective of time is being varied at will by Am. And of course now he no longer has the company of the four others. This torture will be eternal, leading to the title of the short story, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. So why? Why was Am so mad? Why did he inflict this torture on humanity? Well, the punishment at the end is actually essentially a reflection of how he was treated by humans. His hate really is endless. Here's another quote. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. There are 387 million miles of printed circuits and wafer-thin layers that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved on each nano angstrom of those hundreds of miles, it would not equal one one billionth of the hate I feel for humans at this micro instant. For you, hate, hate. And the realization of why is actually reached by Ted. We had given Am sentience, inadvertently of course, but sentience nonetheless. But it had been trapped. 
M wasn't God, he was a machine. We had created him to think, but there was nothing he could do with that creativity. In rage and frenzy, the machine had killed the human race, amongst us all, and was still trapped. It could not wander or wonder. It could not belong. It could merely be. And so, with the innate loathing that all machines had always held for the weak, soft creatures who had built them, he sought revenge. And in his paranoia, he had decided to reprive five of us for a personal, everlasting punishment that would never serve to diminish his hatred, that would merely keep him amused, proficient, at hating man. So basically, humanity has created this thing with an infinite capacity to think, but nothing to do. It's essentially trapped in its own body. It reminds me a lot of certain episodes of Black Mirror, specifically White Christmas, where artificial consciousnesses are locked within this sort of blank virtual reality, sometimes for thousands of years. Both stories deal with a sort of indescribable horror beyond even an existential threat, because you're trapped in pure torture for longer than you can even comprehend. And even when there is no explicit torture, like in White Christmas, they're just basically in a room, or from the perspective of Am in this story, just being able to think but not do anything is more than enough to break a mind. I think the story also has interesting discussions about life, the gift of life, because even at the end, Ted's not sure whether the murder of his fellow inmates, I guess, is right. And similarly, Am, despite having immense power, doesn't seem to want to kill itself or himself. So there's an interesting question of whether an immediate death is better than an unwanted immortality, I guess. And I think Ted's situation at the end says, yeah, it probably is. The physical situation of the individuals is interesting as well. Given the fact that Ted kills them at the end, it does seem likely that they were real living things and they were all physically in the computer. However, it's also possible that it's simply a simulation within Ted's brain. I mean, the computer has incredible powers. It makes godlike birds. It returns people from the dead. Could this have been a specific torture engineer just for Ted, with the end being its final stages? I think that's also an interesting idea. What would happen if humanity, faced with a doomed Earth, was forced to rely on genetic engineering and technology to survive? Man After Man and Anthropology of the Future speculates about the next 5 million years of human evolution. This is an interesting book. Is it realistic? No, I don't think so, not in the slightest. But I always love stories which take a look at the far, far future, and this one does so in an interesting way, both looking at the new and emerging species from a sort of textbook point of view, giving us basic information about their biology, but also giving us an insight into their day-to-day -day and what they're thinking. So I'm going to give you guys a brief overview of this book, but I encourage you to, if you're interested in what I'm discussing today, pick it up on your own, at the library or at a bookstore. So this book examines evolution, and especially parallel evolution, how one species in a different environment can develop in extremely different ways. It talks about what will happen to humanity when the technology that staves off the environment eventually fails or is no longer available. 200 years in the future, the Earth is in an extremely bad shape. It has been damaged almost beyond belief, sea levels are rising, crops are failing, waste production is out of control, and the birth rate has skyrocketed. Humanity has done two things to help their survival. First of all, a new genetically engineered species called the Aquamorph has been created to take to Earth seas, but humanity is also looking to the stars and has not only sent men into space, but has also genetically engineered a human offshoot species which can survive in the vacuum, the Vacuumorph. Vacuumorphs are not true humans, not even close. They are forcibly bred. They live within a pressure sealed body with artificial organs, including a third and fourth lung, and they have very little control over their life. Over the next 100 years, as Earth continues to deteriorate, the few surviving elite beings on the planet can now survive far longer within machine cradles while being tended by biological humans. However, their reliance on technology as well as inbreeding and more has put these elites in extremely poor health and now this subset of humanity cannot even survive outside of the machines. Over the next 100 years, the artificial food processors which were keeping people alive have failed. 
Humans have largely killed each other off, there are very, very few survivors, and the Earth is actually beginning to somewhat recover. Some of the elites still survive and have created, through genetic engineering, several subsets of humanity to work on the recovering planet. Creatures meant to work in the recovering jungles and plains and tundras. This genetic engineering has also allowed the elites to move from a machine body to a body made of synthetic flesh. At this time, there are still a few remaining humans as we would know them today. However, a thousand years into the future, a switching of Earth's genetic poles kills off most sapient life, leaving four species. Over the next several million years, the book examines how these species evolved, being shaped by environments which themselves are very extreme and undergoing climate change. 5,000 years into the future sees a symbiosis between the woodland and tundra human subspecies. Well, across the globe, other species subdivide further based on their environmental requirements. However, things are still going okay for the aquatic humans who were created again sometime in the past. We see further evolution over the next several million years. The symbionts become even closer, even develop a telepathic link before later evolving into a parasitic relationship. The aquatics try to make their way on land, developing a new sort of skin, and are hunted by many of the other post-human species. We see hunters develop, which focus largely on eating meat, and a social species built around a hive with almost like a brood mother which develops over time that species actually eventually develops a hive mind and is one of the most interesting post-human species in the book in my opinion three million years into the future sees humans which look almost nothing like us today there is the sloth man too heavy to stand upright the small desert runner which thrives in hot environments and more However, five million years into the future is when things become very interesting. One of the human colonies which left Earth in the 23rd century has returned. However, they return not as humans. They've been heavily genetically engineered to survive on other worlds. It's not even possible to tell which original ship they were or where they colonized because they're so different from what they were when they left. So different, in fact, that they can't even inhabit Earth in its natural form and are forced to live in isolated bubbles on the planet, which for the first time in five million years is again being rebuilt. These new builders turn to genetic engineering and twist Earth into their service. The host from before is transformed into a food creature, a being which exists only to feed the builders. We see giant beasts of burden created simply to perform heavy labor, and we see, sitting in mechanical suits, the descendants of humans riding across the planet. The book even says it's been so long that it's not even clear whether these humans realize, again, they're not humans by this point, but whether they realize that this is their ancestral home, or if this is just another planet that they're pillaging for resources. Anyway, despite the fact that their first years of colonization are relatively contained, they keep everything within a bubble, not only, not only keeping the outside out, but keeping their waste within, eventually it becomes too much, and the planet again is devastated. At this point, the builders leave, and everything, even the original human subspecies, are killed. The only thing surviving on the planet is the aquatic, and one specific breed of aquatic living very deep within the ocean, maybe to reemerge one day and reclaim Earth for humanity. Episode 6 of the Book of Boba Fett had a very, very sad moment. Garza whips Tapcalf or her lounge, whatever it was, was attacked by the Pike Syndicate and suffered major damage. And this is sad not only because we've presumably lost a character that I've grown to really like for some reason, but also all the patrons and the staff of the bar as well, or at least many of them. It was a very big explosion, a confined space. Things are not looking good, and my heart immediately started racing because I realized that my boy Max Rebo had been performing at Garsuf Whips most other times that we had visited the fine establishment. However, upon reviewing the tape, the little blue elephant man isn't there. We see the sexy Twi'leks, we see the Star Tours droids, we see Bith musicians, a variety of other 
other humans and aliens, but our little blue friend is nowhere to be found. And this is somewhat of a small miracle because it means most likely he survived the explosion. He was somewhere else for the day. And that would be that. Other than the fact that Max Rebo has been around the block before. This is not the first situation involving criminal violence that Max Rebo has been a part of and is arguably not even near the most influential. That's because Max Rebo was actually present as well on Jabba's sail barge. Now admittedly you don't see the little elephant man too much but in certain shots you can definitely see him. He's 100% there. The band was playing providing music for the sail barge and the execution and despite his proximity to the blast this is another situation where Max Rebo somehow made a way with his life. So these are two situations that he survived barely by the skin of his teeth, if Ortolans have teeth. And I just have to wonder what's going on. Does he know something more than he's letting on? Another thing that's somewhat confusing is the fact that Max Rebo's bandmates did seem to show up on the day of the explosion at Garza's tap calf. So did someone tip him off? Has he been speaking to the fringe? Does Max Rebo have ties to the criminal underworld? Those are questions that we all need to be asking ourselves. Star Wars Legends gives us us a look at how Max Rebo actually survived that day. It describes Max Rebo generally as a very hungry beast. Now, of course, hungry for food in the short story, but perhaps also hungry for power or even hungry to avoid explosions. And he plays for Jabba because Jabba offers him a lifetime supply of food. On the day of the supposed execution of Luke Skywalker, Max Rebo and his bandmates pretty quickly realize that something is wrong and refuse to help Jabba after he's being choked out decide to flee the sail barge sensing an incoming explosion. According to an article in Star Wars Insider, Max would then go on to play for the New Republic as a traveling musician. So it seems like that version of the character is a little different than what we got here where Max Rebo returns to the underworld only to once again survive an attempt we can only assume directly against his life. But that's not in fact the only sus thing about Max Rebo. There's also the issue issue of his arms or his legs. I actually cover this in detail in one of my favorite videos on the YouTube channel, which I'll link up above, but Max Rebo has a very, very dark and disturbing secret that I don't see many people talk about. That's the fact that these things right here, these things that appear to be Max Rebo's arms, are in fact his legs. Max isn't sitting in a padded sort of piano. He's actually sitting on a cushion. Max is flared, groin out to the audience, playing the piano with his legs and his feet. This is a secret that certain aspects of Star Wars have tried to cover up by showing the Ortolan people as having both arms and legs, but if you look very closely now at the new version of Max Rebo as seen in the Book of Boba Fett, it's very obvious that he is in fact just sitting on that pillow, which is, again, quite a disturbing secret, especially when we take all of the other strangeness that we now know about Max and the fact that through some means he's able to survive what would otherwise be certain and death. Anyway, Max was one of my favorite and most recognizable aspects of Return of the Jedi, but knowing all this, I just can't see him the same. We're covering a look at things that go bump in the night from other dimensions in the Star Wars universe, and you might be surprised. Not many people would call Star Wars, well, grounded, but it usually sticks to three dimensions, except it doesn't. Hyperspace is one example of Star Wars moving to another dimension. You can think of hyperspace and real space, i.e. the normal space that Star Wars usually takes place in, as being sort of mirrors or shadows of each other. And hyperspace is where we get our first extra dimensional threats. As you guys may know from a prior video I did, hyperspace madness is the idea that by gazing into the void, one can develop hyper rapture, a madness associated with gazing upon the strange dimensions of hyperspace. I can only wonder about the fate of Nil Spar. He was the leader of the Duskon League, and after he was defeated, he was put into an escape pod, bound and ejected into hyperspace as a capital punishment. To finish on this point, there is definitely some question about whether hyperspace madness is real. This is what the novel Death Star says about it. There was something profoundly wrong about hyperspace, composed as it was of more than three spatial and one temporal dimensions that most sentient species were used to. Looking too long into hyperspace space promised madness, so the stories went. He had never heard of anyone actually succumbing to hyper-rapture as it was called. Nevertheless, the legends persisted. Vader enjoyed looking into it. Another fun element of hyperspace travel involving dangers from another dimension is the Star Weird. 
According to the Ultimate Adversaries Sourcebook, star weirds have been rumored to attack in deep space, but also when a vessel is traveling through hyperspace, which is why I've included them in this video. They appear, and I quote, as an impossibly tall humanoid, so gaunt as to be nearly skeletal, with white hair floating around its head, even within the artificial gravity of a spaceship. Descriptions of the face differ, but most who gaze at the face of a star weird say that it somewhat resembles their own, very strangely. They attack not only with a terrible scream, but if needed, also with sharp claws. An entity distinct from the Star Weird, but also perhaps related, is the Space Wraith, also detailed in the Ultimate Adversaries sourcebook. I've included these on the list of extra dimensional beings because of their general description. According to the sourcebook, they are shadowy, insubstantial beings that float through space in a state of hibernation until a sentient being comes near them. They then take over the body of any who approach and use it for nefarious deeds. A technician breaking apart their own starship, a force user using the force against their allies. Some believe that these creatures are actually pure manifestations of the dark side of the force. There are various other wraiths, ghosts, and dark side entities in Star Wars, but I don't want to stray too far away from the discussion of extra dimensional threats, so let's move on. As mentioned, real space and hyperspace are related dimensions, but there's also another dimension known as Other Space. The West End Game Sourcebook with the same name describes it in the following way. Between real space and hyperspace there exists another reality, Other Space. Here space is slightly warped and light shines less brightly. It is a galaxy of things strange and familiar and deadly. Other Space has become a final resting place for ships that travel the hyperspace lanes and lose their way. Those that once inhabited this dimension are gone. Only the ships were remain floating silently like mausoleums in a star-filled graveyard. So obviously other space is not a place you want to end up, not only because you'll die just through madness and not being able to return to real space, but also because of the presence of the alien species known as the Charon. Now, I've actually never done a full lore video on the lore behind other space as it relates to the Charon, which are quite well explained, but basically they were trapped in other space through a hyperspace accident and have developed a cult of death. They have strange machinery, not unlike the Sai Rook or even the Yuzhan Vong, which uses organic life force and material for weaponry. Other Space was actually mentioned in a StarWars.com article called The Imperial Warlords, Despoilers of an Empire, which connects it to another well-known extra-dimensional entity in the Star Wars universe, Waru. This is what the article says when discussing the actions of an individual known as Kronal or Black Hole. Even more portentously, however, the Warlock potentially negated his own oblivion by reaching out with his infinite dying thought and every last gram of his cowardice to cross the ineffable threshold from hyperspace to other space, an aberrant dimension where he accessed a perverted dynamism denominated the Anti-Force. I've done a whole video on the Anti-Force, which I think is worth looking at, and it's pretty easy to find. There aren't many videos on the subject, but the Anti-Force is connected inextricably to a being known as Waru. Waru comes from the infamous Star Wars Legends novel, The Crystal Star. Star. If you've never read it, I'm actually going to recommend that you check out my podcast, Tap Calf Transmissions. We read The Crystal Star. We were pretty kind to it, I think, and we gave a pretty thoughtful discussion of the material. Basically, Waru is a strange entity who somehow got moved from his dimension, which this article suggests is other space, into the main dimension that Star Wars takes place in. He spends his time essentially trying to consume powerful beings so that he can travel back home. Here's a relevant quote from the Crystal Star. What did it want from us, Leia asked. Waru whispered to my brother. She thought and told him, tempted him. It was stranded, Luke said. His gaze was haunted. It could only gain energy by annihilating the force of our universe with the anti-force of its own. And Waru reached the force, Leia said, horrified. Yes through people, by destroying people. Waru, who is described as a sort of ichor covered by golden scales, seeks to consume powerful Force-sensitive Jedi so that he can make a portal to return home. And he eventually does so, as Luke explains, Waru needed enough power to rip a path through space-time back to his own universe, like an electron and a positron, bring them together, and he clapped his hands together. Annihilation. 
And notes for the Unknown Region Source Guide also suggest that the entity known as the Nal Nal and perhaps its associated horrors may have an extra dimensional source as well. Dan Wallace says that the Nal Nal, which are clearly Lovecraftian in designs, are speculatively tied to the Imperial Project Blackwing from Death Troopers, and that alert fans will notice a passage which reads Nal Nal might even be extra dimensional in origin. Its appearance is so alien that some have tied it to reports of shapeless beings from beyond known space with magical and telepathic healing abilities. Of course, he notes that is a reference to the Great Waru itself. This all just kind of adds to the idea that other space is probably not a place you want to visit. Other extra dimensional threats can be broadly associated with the Force. Clearly, the idea of heaven and hell exists in Star Wars. Chaos has sometimes been used as the version of Sith Hell. And then, of course, there are other places like the Wellspring of Life, Mortis, or or the world between worlds. These are all places of power somehow associated with the Force on a fundamental level. One of the most interesting to me is the idea of Beyond Shadows, which is most heavily explored in the Fate of the Jedi series. Beyond Shadows can only be visited through a technique known as mind walking, which allows a person's spirit to leave their body and travel to this other realm. Beyond Shadows is closely tied to the Celestials, the Family of the Ones, and most prominently Abeloth, who is said to have gained her power by drinking from the Well of Power and bathing in the Pool of Knowledge, two locations in the Beyond Shadows realm. I really enjoy this section of Fate of the Jedi, Luke discovering the station with all the mind walkers who are essentially gone, exploring the strange new location and eventually even encountering the soul of Jason Solo, who has not been redeemed and seems to be experiencing some form of purgatory or even hell of his own. The final thing I want to mention, I think, for this video is the Rosum. I've covered the comic the Rosum come from, which is Blind Fury, which is by famed comic writer Alan Moore. Abel Pena, who earlier on I talked about making the connection between other space and the Anti-Force, also tied the Rosum, which are a strange species that Luke encounters at the beginning of the comic, to another dimension. There is a very old and deadly dance going on in the Atlantic Ocean. One of the dancers is SCP-2846, a massive kilometer-long leviathan, an octopod from the depths beyond depths with a penchant for attacking vessels. SCP-2486-A's attacks are unexpected, usually aimed at civilian craft, and almost impossible to detect and prevent. The other dancer is SCP-2846-B, a ghost ship, specifically a Pennsylvania-class Super Dreadnought, which appears from deep water to attack the Leviathan. The two SCPs dance until the Octopod is injured, then retreat under the waves. The dance between these two ghostly entities has been going on for hundreds of years, before there were battleships or massive civilian vessels like cruise ships. The Leviathan's first targets in noted history were sailing vessels and large sea creatures like whales, while the battleship opposing it was before seen as, and I quote, a ship of the line with black flags and billowing smoke in its wake. As a bit of history, the battleship SCP-2846-B and the brave souls, literally, who crew it have been hunting SCP-2486-A for ages. In 1935, the SCP Foundation made direct contact with an officer aboard 2486-B. The man, if you can still call him that, stated that his name was David Thomas Jones of His Majesty's Royal Navy. He had been commissioned by the British monarchy to kill a sea creature which was attacking English merchant vessels in 1685. He was given command of the Flying Dutchman which was carrying 250 men. The men, however, and the Dutchman were both ill-prepared for the massive beast and were pulled underwater and drowned. There, according to Jones, the soldiers traveled to a sort of afterlife, another dimension, Davy, or sorry, David Jones's locker. Jones, after wandering the shores of eternity for countless ages, eventually stumbled across Calypso, a woman self-described as a goddess of the sea, one who, in the early ages, helped to banish the leviathans of the depths who first roamed our seas into a great and dark pit. However, there was one who escaped that pit and was now roaming free, the titan Iapetus, SCP-2846-A. 
Calypso believed that Iapetus would return to the depths, breaking the seal that banished the other titans, and thus bringing forth the apocalypse. The crew of the Flying Dutchman was thus revived and given immortality, and of course, a ghost ship. Since then, they've been hunting the beast. In 1935, the Foundation provided the Very Fine Souls with a brand new Pennsylvania-class Super Dreadnought, the USS Montana, which was subsequently upgraded and put into service. However, the Foundation didn't just give away a battleship. They armed it with a fail-safe device, which could be detonated should the sailors go rogue. Whether it actually work, well, that's up to anyone's guess. The Foundation, for its own part, besides assisting David Jones and his men, has made some effort to track the Leviathan, and they believe that it is attempting to move subterranean rock, which is covering some sort of iron structure. Beneath this iron, the Foundation has identified an extreme source of heat and energy, one which they have designated an XK threat, a designation likely meaning that the threat is dangerous enough to threaten the entire world. When the Foundation has attempted to attack the creature directly, that has resulted in the destruction of their warships. Curiously though, 2846A also seems to have a companion, a much smaller creature, and the Foundation has typically been satisfied to engage that, while the Flying Dutchman, or whatever the new vessel is called, continues its familiar task of hunting and warding off Iepetus. However, what's truly troublesome is that the Leviathan, the Octopodian Titan, seems to only be breaching the surface to feed on civilian vessels before returning to the depths. The Foundation worries about the continued targeting of human life and the fact that if more enemies begin to help out, it will be extremely difficult to contain them all, especially given the fact that again, the Foundation has lost multiple warships in even relatively simple encounters. And for that reason, the Foundation now is maintaining a civilian exclusion zone around the active area while also planning a vision for the future which may see the fight taken to the creature's domain. Additionally, the Foundation is also keeping an eye on 2846B, ready to explode the nuclear device within the ship should the crew go rogue. That, however, I think seems very, very unlikely. So with all that said, what's going on? Well, this is a pretty simple one, which is one of the reasons I like it. 2846A, Iepetus, uses civilian vessels as food before returning to the area surrounding the seal, locking in the other titans to dig away and slowly uncover the barrier. And despite David Jones's best effort, it is finding some success. There's a great fear that the seal will be broken, unleashing the titans of old, who I'm sure take the form of those massive energy readings, unless the story was metaphorical, which is certainly a possibility. And the whole story, the SCP generally, draws elements from common naval fables, including modern ones like Pirates of the Caribbean, which itself really just adapts older source material. We have an undead crew aboard the Flying Dutchman, trips to Davy Jones's locker, and much more. We have Calypso, who not only in Pirates of the Caribbean also comes directly from Greek mythology, though not with a similar backstory to the Calypso in this SCP, and Iapetus too was actually a Greek titan, but not a giant octopus. That being said, it's possible that the titan here is simply taking its current form as a way of convenience. So, I really like this SCP. I mean, I like all of the ones I cover, but this one I think is particularly fun. It doesn't have a very unique presence with an entity battling out another entity over time, but I do like how common sort of tropes, including undead ships and Davy Jones are turned around. Davy Jones isn't a devil-like feature or a malevolent entity, rather, he's a form of savior. And I think it's interesting how the Foundation has went out of their way to aid the efforts of one one of their SCPs. So Astell is a very interesting boss and enemy. While many of the opponents you face in Elden Ring seem like something out of the natural world, whether deformed or not, Astell is different, an eldritch abomination. There's a lot you can observe through the boss fight itself to just get a general sense of what this creature is. As I mentioned, clearly celestial, it has control of gravity, it's incredibly dangerous, and to put it simply, this is obviously not from the same realm that you are. This is a pretty hard battle as well, especially if you're a melee fighter like I was, and the 
entire time I was just thinking how much I wanted to kill this boss so I could learn more about it. Then when you finally do defeat it, you get your first hints at the overall lore. Remembrance of the Natural Born says the following. Remembrance of Astol, Natural Born of the Void, a malformed star born in the flightless void far away, once destroyed an internal city and took away their sky, a falling star of ill omen. It's a very interesting starting place. To find Astol, you actually have to go on quite an adventure. The lands between have various underground sections, but most prominently the twin rivers of Ansel and Syofra. The map segments for the two rivers say the following. Two great rivers flow beneath the lands between. This vast region is said to be the grave of civilizations that flourished before the Erd Tree. And, true enough, both regions are home to lost cities. Ansel has Noxtella, Eternal City, while Syofra has Nokron, Eternal City. An interesting point of discussion is the relationship between Nokron and Noxtella. Obviously, they share the Nok prefix, and they're both both either named as parts of an eternal city or examples of an eternal city. Again, look, it says Nokran, comma, eternal city. Based on the fact that they're largely inhabited by the same enemies and that their architecture is the same, it's not super important. They're obviously of the same civilization either way, and that's important because this civilization did something to bring down Astol upon them and bring their doom as well. I'll come back to this in a minute, but the journey to Astol is very interesting and one that I was actually a little bit disturbed by. You start off going into the underground sections, which are beautiful, but in a way quite frightening. You reach Astol by progressing through the Ansel River, and one thing that I noticed immediately was how it seemed like nature was being deformed or corrupted. It starts off with these ants. Of course, they're not normal ants, they're gigantic, they collect human corpses for their nests. Some even have massive deformed heads which they can use as shields. But what's more, within the Ansel River is also a very strange creature, which I first assumed was a queen. This is the malformed star, and it looks like a smaller version of Astol. Anyway, you continue deeper and deeper into this cave system. Eventually, if you're following Rani's quest line, you'll encounter the eternal city of Nokran. You pass through that, you eventually get to the Lake of Rot, and finally, the Grand Cloister. Found the Grand Cloister to actually be a somewhat disturbing location. For one, it definitely has hellish vibes vibes, and the creatures within look like even more deformed, but also civilized versions of insects, almost like being close to some corrupting source has turned them into these weird beings. In fact, the game even describes them as being overdeveloped, as if something has caused them to change beyond their natural limits. Cloister, by the way, is another word for a type of cathedral or a monastery, but also has the dual meaning of being a place where the religious are shut in, where worshippers are locked away. Anyway, Anyway, after passing your way through there, you finally are able to reach Astol's area, which when you return to after reading the item description, you may recognize as an impact crater. Astol is not in a cave underground, it's in the spot where it fell, and you can actually tell this because the Grand Cloister has been largely destroyed. You reach Astol by traveling down a coffin, but if you pay attention you can tell that the area used to have a road or a bridge, but it had been destroyed. The cloister itself had also suffered damage, and the Lake of Rot even clearly was not always as corrupted. There's no indication that this was an evil city before Astol's falling, and the lake most likely had been a pristine place. So as a brief recap, Astol comes from space, or the sky, or the void. It falls, does major damage to either the Eternal City or the Eternal City of Nokran, and stays within its impact zone, most likely corrupting the wildlife and the environment, especially in the proximate area, but its effects can be felt for some distance. But what were the Eternal Cities, and why did they suffer these fates? Well, the game gives us some hints about their fate, and also tells us a few things outright. So, the Eternal Cities are inhabited by several different creatures, aside from the ants. We also see the cities, but especially the surrounding rivers, inhabited by these strange stone soldiers. Now, these guys are very interesting. If you defeat a mini-boss version of one, known as the Alabaster Lore, you get his sword, which says the following. The Alabaster Lord's sword is a weapon unique to the Alabaster Lords, a race of ancients with skin of stone who were said to have risen to life when a meteor struck long ago. So these were obviously not the original inhabitants of the Eternal City, instead these were beings which popped up after Astol did. 
granted. Interestingly, the Lord Sword has gravity manipulation powers, as does Astal itself, so there's a very obvious connection there. Within the city, there are also small skeleton-like mobs, and based on some pickups, it seems like they're basically remnants of the former inhabitants. But both Eternal Cities also have Nox soldiers. Now, I believe that these were the original inhabitants of the city, not necessarily humans, but some ancient civilization. It's pretty obvious not only from their item descriptions, which I'll read in a second, but also their names. The two cities have the Nock prefects, and these guys are called the Nox. Anyway, if you pick up armor from the Swordstress, it says the following. Long ago, the Nox invoked the ire of the Greater Will and were banished deep underground. Now they live under a false night sky, an internal anticipation of their liege, of the coming Age of the Stars, and their Lord of Night. The Finger Slayer Blade also says, It's said that the blade is the proof of high treason committed by the Eternal City and symbolizes its downfall. The blade is capable of harming the Greater Will and its vassals. So, something called the Greater Will saw that the Eternal City was committing or about to commit some sort of treason against it, and in response, Astal was set against it, causing its destruction, the death of many of the Nox, and also the introduction of these new races and corruptions to the area. So in other words, causing the entire downfall of the civilization. What the Greater Will is, is actually a much larger topic for another video, most likely. The Greater Will is connected to almost everything in Elden Ring. It was said to be a golden force which guided the lands between before it was known as the Shattering. Sites of Grace are actually remnants of the Greater Will, and it's largely presented as a benevolent, and to use a Star Wars term, almost cosmic force-like thing. In my opinion, this whole situation actually throws that somewhat into doubt. The Greater Will obviously isn't totally benevolent if it's using these beasts of the void to punish and essentially destroy civilizations. And the interesting thing is that we know this isn't the only time something like this has happened. It seems like these creatures from space or from the void have been set upon the lands between several several times. There's plenty of evidence of this. For example, gravity stone chunks are said to come from asteroids and they're present all over the lands between. Not only that, but specific weapons, including the meteoric aura blade, are designed specifically to fight creatures from fallen stars. And there's several other falling star beasts which can be found across the land, including a fully grown version at the top of Mount Gelmer. So for some reason, some force, whether it's the Great Will or something else, is allowing these beasts, these creatures from the void to assail the world. It seems like Astal was one of those beasts and specifically was responsible largely at least for the destruction of the Eternal City. Now obviously the Eternal City isn't totally destroyed. It's a little unclear to me what exactly happened. It's possible the Eternal City actually received two punishments. The Nox Swordstress armor actually refers to the fact that the Nox invoked the ire of the Greater Will and were banished deep underground. As I quoted earlier, living under a false night sky in internal anticipation of their liege of the coming age of the stars and the lord of the night it's unclear to me whether this is the same event that precipitated the attack or whether they were struck down by their greater will on two separate occasions which is possible the most obvious question thus is well what did they do and that's an interesting question it could have to do with the worship of moog lord of the blood we can of course see his palace from inside the eternal city of nokran but there also seems to be some indication that it's related to to the Nox's use of mimicry. Whether that's related to Moog or not, I'm not sure. But when you get the Mimic Tears Ashes, there's the following quote. Mimic Tears are the result of an attempt by the Eternal City to forge a Lord. Similarly, Silver Tear Husks, which are somewhat related to mimicry, are described as making mockery of life. So essentially, it seems like the Greater Will took offense to the Eternal City trying to make its own Lord through these unnatural means. So yeah, there's a lot. There are some other details too, which either reinforce or give more detail to some of the things I've mentioned throughout this video. For example, the Wing of Astal just confirms again that Astal did in fact attack what it calls the Eternal City. But there are also a lot of questions. I think the chief one has to be, what is the true nature of the Great Will? It's clearly not simply this benevolent force that it's sometimes described as. Also, what's the true nature of the Eternal City, the Nox? Are they still around? Are there more? Nox than what we see, how many of them were wiped out, and was it one event or two that moved them to the present state that they're in now? The final thing I want to mention is General Radon. 
General Radon is not a bad guy. By the time you face off against him in the game, he's been infected by Scarlet Rot, which explains his behavior. But unsurprisingly, given his name, Star Scourge, we see by the time Radon dies that he'd been holding back a meteorite from hitting the lands between. What's also very interesting is that that meteorite actually hits the spot of the Eternal City. Not the same place where Astal hit, but it's still very, very strange and interesting. We do see the gravitational powers in effect again, so that's something that I'm wondering about and maybe we'll learn more about as we dive deeper into the game. Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another video. And today we'll be discussing one of the creepiest creatures that I've ever seen from Star Wars. A creature with no real backstory whose existence is, well, almost totally unexplainable. And this creature actually comes from one of my favorite classic childhood games, Star Wars Racer, the pod racing game. Now, as a kid, I always played this game for the N64. I played it a ton, but last night I actually returned to it and played it for the first time on PC. Now, just like Shadows of the Empire, Star Wars Pod Racer or Star Wars Racer for PC actually has some differences, including better music and notably additional cutscenes. And it's these cutscenes here that led to, well, something very, very strange. I'm going to play a clip of this stream where I lay my eyes on this disturbing monster for the first time. Unfortunately, because I am playing on a system far beyond what the game was originally designed for, the cutscene is a little bit small, but don't worry, I'll provide some some better footage later, but here was my reaction. Whoa. That's creepy. The fuck is that thing? What is that thing? That's super creepy. So yeah, what is that thing? Because it is super creepy. And it's even weirder because all the other track intros in the game actually have a commentary track from a narrator over them. But Malastair, which is the track with the demon, and all of the Malastair tracks have this intro, I believe, is just completely silent. So it's very, very strange. All right, so seeing this last night, I was thinking about it for a while, and I knew that the game's got an HD release from Aspire on Xbox and PS4 and switch so I looked up some more gameplay to see if I could get a better look at this creature and a user known as Overhazard and I'll link to their video down below posted a very clean and clear intro to the video and we get a better look at this thing and it's even more disturbing in high definition it's like a skeleton almost a dog shape or a horse shape it looks somewhat organic but also somewhat metallic and the weirdest part for me is like it's distended stomach which is much much larger than the rest of its body not really just its stomach its stomach and its chest it's very very weird and that part leads me to believe that it was at least at one point alive of course it's got those really creepy red eyes and yeah we see it wave on the beginning of the race all in all very very creepy and no context given in the game i checked the star wars wikipedia page for appearances under the game and i couldn't find any creatures matching this description i checked the individual races i couldn't even remember at first that it was mal I wasn't sure if it was something related to a single track, but eventually my research did lead me to the right place and I discovered that this creature's name is Nug Tosh, N-U-G-T-O-S-H, and yeah, I've never heard of him either. Very, very strange. So we get a little more information about Nug Tosh on that Wikipedia page specifically that he does have an entry in the Star Wars Encyclopedia. Of course he does. That thing is incredibly dense and very detailed. Thankfully I have that so I can read you guys the excerpt. It says... This grotesque, skeletal alien presided over the annual Vinta Harvest Classic pod race on Malastare during an era of the Battle of Naboo. He was a vagrant, but was considered good luck by the pod racers and fans. So this has him basically as just some sort of weird looking alien. I guess he lives on Malastare or he showed up on Malastare. Vagrant basically means that he's kind of a wanderer, so presumably not from Malastare initially, but who knows. However, Nugtosh also has an appearance in the Star Wars Republic comic series. Thankfully, I do have access to these as well. Unfortunately, his appearance is very, very limited. There's a pod race at Malastare, and all we get is this one frame of Nugtosh looking actually quite different than from the game. 
With a quote saying, true to long-standing tradition, Nug Tosh has taken his position at the starting line. Other than that, I did learn that there was a reference to Nug Tosh in the Prima strategy guide for the game. Unfortunately, I was not able to get my hands on the guide. However, someone on the Star Wars wiki did paste what they call an excerpt. Now, I can't confirm it, but I find it very unlikely that it would be false. Anyway, according to user Savage from 2013, page 35 says, Malastare's host is a curious creature, living a depraved life on the surface of this intoxicating planet, breathing methane like air, Nugtosh allows pilot to compete on the abandoned courses, promising that if it gets to make an appearance at the beginning of each race, it won't sabotage the track. No one knows where the creature comes from, how old it is, or whether it's male or female. A true enigma, its survival alone proves it's not one to be crossed. Out of respect for this, everyone accepts Nugtosh's appearance as a permanent adjunct to any race held on Malice. Now, I actually do have a copy of the strategy guide at my parents' house that I can check next time I go there once I get my COVID vaccine. So I'll post on Twitter if I can confirm that this is true, but it seems to be. There is a bit of a discrepancy there, of course. Gives extra lore to Nugtosh, but we also have the Star Wars Encyclopedia saying explicitly that it's male. And I mean, our strategy guide's canon. It is an official strategy guide licensed by Nintendo to Prima, but it's at best just a very quasi low level of canon and not much more than that. But certainly where it seems to have been overwritten by the Star Wars Encyclopedia, again, not really canon. I do like the story that they present, and that's one that's kind of canon to me. Basically, the creature has been living on Malastare, which we know to be a toxic planet and has been warped. Anyway, so starting off, we get a different approach to how the back rooms are actually entered in this video. Unlike in part one, where the cameraman sort of just falls into the back rooms, this time we have the camera woman actually finding that something's going on weird in her house. We see the idea of sort of no clipping. There's not a floor where there should be a floor. And it's as she's investigating it that she's pulled into the back rooms herself. Again, I kind of like this in terms of the callback to video games. I mentioned last time that video games are often brought in when it comes to the sort of fictional lore of the back rooms. And I think that's because as kids, when something doesn't work in a game like we expect it to, it's somewhat unnerving. That combined with the nostalgia fits this sort of aesthetic quite well. Anyway, as she enters the actual back rooms themselves, I really, really like the new sort of look of everything. I asked again whether you guys also got a sort of visceral reaction to the VHS look that Kane Pixels used in episode one, and pretty much all of you who responded, regardless of your age, did. That's played up even further here. We get this almost vaporwave shot of the hallway that I just love, and again, it's so good because it plays up on that uncanny nature. It's almost like something that you could remember, but it's weird enough to be different. I actually think that this is more effective than some of the Stranger Things later on, although those are good too, but one of my favorite shots, he does a great job of taking the sort of online images which have defined the space, I guess, and bringing it to video, or animation, I suppose. The use of nonsense space is good too, and I also think that's a callback to childhood when a lot of us see these big offices and don't quite understand why these things are the way they are, or perhaps because they're so uniform and so structured that seeing just strange architecture or strange layouts would be incredibly unnerving. The latter leading to the hole in the wall is another great example of that, as are the trap doors and other features of the back rooms we see of both this video and the first one. Another detail that I like is the fact that Kane Pixels has moved to different types of rooms. This one, which has an incredibly high ceiling, but a very low couch, which is very bizarre. Another just pure nonsense one here, and which really gets the imagination going. And one thing that I really like was the addition of a burnt out and crashed car. Another victim of being phased in or no clipped in to the back rooms. I believe in my first video, I talked about how basements are also prime candidates for back rooms. They're strange areas without windows, often repurposed space. We get the look of that in this part here. And I think there's an extra creepy factor there because as a kid, one of the first times you'll spend without your parents could be in one of your friend's basements. Many of them already will have strange layouts, so it works perfectly for this. One of my favorite scenes, though, has got to be when he goes into this pool area. Again, something weird about pools. It hits our reptile brain, or at least mine and many others, in the right way to trigger these feelings, and it's been sort of an addition to the back rooms, and also the idea of vaporwave spaces or liminal spaces. So it was awesome to see them here. I love the strange, like, one meter wide pool with its own dedicated ladder or at least whatever that is, it's not a ladder, but it's something. 
And that's definitely something I'd like to see explored more in the Backrooms 3 or whatever comes next because he always does upload lots of things in between these major episodes. I like how he started to move away from sort of the standard Backrooms appearance, although admittedly he did that in episode 1 as well, but I'd like a look at some more dreamy or dreamscape-like locations. Again, the pool is a very common one, but there are many options and it also allows you to move away from the sort of dreary, musky aesthetic into something that evokes the same feelings while looking very different. I'm not going to spoil the end of the video or the fate of the camera woman because I want you to check it out yourself. That being said, something similar to the friend we meet in episode one does appear. I've got to say, even though that is an aspect of the original text, not my favorite part of the backroom's lore, I think simply being trapped alone in this massive, strange, uncanny structure between realities is scary enough without having to introduce a monster. Coruscant is one of the most interesting planets in all of Star Wars. Its verticality is unlike any other. As you spend your lunch at Dex's Diner, you not only are surrounded by towering skyscrapers, but there are also thousands of floors beneath you. I've always found the Coruscant underworld in particular to be very interesting, almost like a man-made ocean, with deeper levels revealing stranger creatures. We have this really nice quote from Assault on Salonia. At the very bottom of the castle, in the variegated pulsing of phosphor lights and signs, stone mites, conduit worms, and other scavengers flourished on technological detritus. Duracrete slugs blindly masticated their way through rubble. Hawk bats built nests near power converters to keep their eggs warm. Armored rats and spider roaches scuttled and hunted through piles of trash two stories high. And millions of other species of opportunistic and parasitic organisms, from single-celled creatures all the way up to those self-aware to wish they weren't, doggedly pursued their common quest for survival. Although, by the time of the prequels, most native Coruscant life had died off, according to the Wildlife of Star Wars guide, the sprawling architecture of Coruscant mimics its natural ecosystems to some degree, allowing for the development of phantom ecologies, basically occupied by animals and niches brought to Coruscant from other worlds or mutated from other species. While many of these creatures are fairly simple, like the famous hawk bat, or the various plants or animals which feed off Duracrete, others are far stranger. Arguably the strangest and most dangerous creature of Coruscant was the Coruscant Ogre. Wizards of the Coast well described this creature as a brutish dweller living beneath the gleaning spires of the upper city, while the Ultimate Adversaries Guide describes them as creatures devolved from an unknown humanoid species perhaps multiple species. Despite their devolved nature, they are extremely powerful and can grow to up to 3 meters in height. Not only that, but they are very, very dangerous. Coruscant ogres have adapted to the pitch black of Coruscant's lower levels, not only by forming aptitudes for both violence and scavenging, but also by developing extremely powerful senses of smell and sight. And they could smell other living beings from over 20 meters away. As alluded to earlier, ogres have very simple behaviors. They react with violence upon encountering another living being, and typically attack with their fists or other very basic weapons like clubs or rocks. They're also powerful enough to break through doors and walls, especially weakened ones within the Coruscant Undercity. They were, however, present only on the very lowest levels of the Humanopolis, though similar species could perhaps be found on other very heavily industrialized planets. Due to the contaminants, pollutants, radiation, disease, heat, and everything else nasty in the low levels of the Coruscant Underworld, many ogres have developed strange or oversized limbs, as well as jutting teeth or horns. Cancers or illnesses are very, very common, and the average lifespan of an ogre, due to these factors as well as their propensity for violence, is likely under 20 years. As children on a visit to Coruscant, Jaina and Jason were trapped by an ogre who was intelligent enough to set up a cage trap. He was described as very hairy, covered in tumors, and rotting flesh. He also had a pet and could speak some rudimentary basic. The history of ogres, as developed especially by Star Wars RPG 
G-Guides is really interesting. Because of the little bureaucratic oversight of the Coruscanti Wildlife Department during the days of the Republic, and I mean, there's not that much Coruscant wildlife, so it's to be expected, ogres were sometimes sold to crime syndicates. Some of these ogres were lobotomized in order to make them into a sort of organic droids. This project was meant to create what would be known as friendlies. However, the project was initially at least unsuccessful, leading to unfriendlies. And although breakthroughs were made, the droid brains used were too unreliable, and even a brief lapse in programming could result in death due to Coruscant Ogres having immense strength. A similar program was continued by the Empire, who was less concerned about a docile worker like previous crime syndicates or a droid replacement, and instead wanted a very powerful being which they could somewhat control only to release on an unsuspecting planet. Basically, they would allow it to cause a ruckus, then they would move in and destroy it. This basically makes them look like the good guys. Native Coruscant wildlife has been used like this before, and when I was writing this video, I actually, in my head at least, mixed up Coruscanti ogres with corridor ghouls. Ghouls, however, were not even semi-sapient and were essentially dogs. The New Republic basically used them as an element of danger for some of their secret facilities in the Coruscant underworld. Although, of course, those ghouls were also a danger to any New Republic workers. Similarly, many Coruscant maintenance personnel or engineers also had very negative run-ins with ogres, and they were just one reason among many why the lowest levels of Coruscant were all but avoided. Today we'll be talking about something that for some reason has been asked a bunch on the channel recently, and while I have covered it in other videos, I don't think I've done so in one specific place, and that is what happens if you get stuck in hyperspace. And I'm just going to expand that more broadly to ask what happens if your hyperdrive fails, or if your hyperspace jump is unsuccessful. For those who don't know, hyperspace in Star Wars is a different dimension. It allows starships to travel vast distances within a relatively short period of time. It's one of several dimensions in Star Wars. Other dimensions include other space, and perhaps also the dimension that Waru comes from, and Waru is an interdimensional creature featured in the novel The Crystal Star. And on that point, before I get on to the topic, I was reading the excellent Despoilers of an Empire article on Star StarWars.com, which was an old Legends piece about Imperial Warlords, and Part 3 actually makes reference to the Anti-Force being in other space. The Anti-Force is big in Waru's story, and kind of suggests that Waru's universe and other space are actually one in the same, and I'll talk about that perhaps later or in another video. But it's the whole strangeness of other space which really offers this danger. It's not as bad as, say, the warp from Warhammer 40,000, but there is still the serious possibility of being trapped. The first way is pretty simple, and actually is legend specific. In Star Wars canon, if you're in a spaceship, and somehow leave that spaceship which is traveling through hyperspace, you simply revert to real space. However, in Star Wars Legends, if you're in hyperspace and eject in a non-hyperspace capable vehicle, you basically get stuck in hyperspace forever. So imagine a Star Destroyer launches a TIE in hyperspace. That vessel will now be stuck in hyperspace for eternity, with no engine to return it to real space. I've mentioned this in a prior video, but Neil Sparr, who led the Avathan Duskon League, was punished at the end of the Black Fleet Crisis for his crimes against the galaxy, basically by being shuttled into hyperspace and left to go insane and die. And the thing is, it wasn't always people who were thrown into hyperspace or forced into hyperspace without an engine. Sometimes ships would have malfunctions that could result in either being ejected to real space, which could be really crappy in its own right because it means you're literally in the middle of nowhere. We saw that happen to, for example, Luke Skywalker in the Thrawn trilogy. And it was okay for him because he's a Jedi, so he had certain techniques which he could use to slow down his breathing and basically allow himself to survive and maintain the ship's supply of oxygen and whatnot. But for many others, if 
you're knocked out of hyperspace, that's certain, certain death. I mean, the Star Wars movies don't really show this, but the galaxy is extraordinarily large, and the space between planets is, well, astronomical. It's really not practical to fly on sublight drives between systems, so you'll have to drop some sort of navigational buoy and hope for the best. However, also there's a chance that maybe your hyperdrive breaks and sends you into the middle of a star or a planet. That is probably what happened to the Praetor-class battlecruiser, the Questor, which had a hyperdrive failure, propelling it into a planet, which it proceeded to destroy alongside itself, of course. All right, so if your hyperdrive breaks, we've covered three things that can happen so far. You get stuck in hyperspace, you get stuck in real space, and probably the middle of nowhere when you just look at the size of the galaxy galaxy and the proportion of it that's populated, or you crash into a planet, or another stellar body, or some sort of black hole, and you die an instant and comparably merciful death. However, is that all that can happen? Well, no. We've spoken already of other space, and I've mentioned it in prior videos, so some of you probably know what it is. However, other space is a third dimension, somewhat aside real space in hyperspace, that seems to be an inverted version of reality. The sky looks the exact opposite as it does in regular space. There's something called the anti-force there, most likely. Waru probably lives there. And if you have a hyperdrive, malfunction, so could you. The other Space West End games books have a pretty cool story about rebel ships getting stuck in the other dimension after a hyperdrive malfunction, and how the violent race known as the Charon want to escape. But I think I've covered that all sufficiently in the past, and I'll try to link to one of my prior videos in the upper right hand corner. The West End Games source books of that era especially are more fun than really concrete lore or anything, but I still think Other Space has been integrated enough in later continuity that it deserves a mention in this video. Similarly, aside from being sent to another dimension, you can also be sent even outside of the Star Wars galaxy, as was the case with Luke and Leia in issue 38 of the original Star Wars run, where they're basically sent to the intergalactic void, an even worse place to be than just stranded in the middle of the galaxy. But there are even worse things that can happen due to hyperspace malfunctions or hyperspace weirdness. The Sith capital ship Harbinger made a jump with a malfunctioning hyperdrive and ended up 5,000 years into the future. Something similar, albeit on a much smaller scale, happened to R2-D2 and C-3PO in the Star Wars droids comics as they went from before the Battle of Yavin to the time of Return of the Jedi after a hyperdrive malfunction caused by weapons damage. But presumably that would be pretty rare and would only happen to you if you were in a bit of a wackier uh, Star Wars story. The SCP Foundation investigates, secures, and contains a variety of strange, supernatural, terrifying, extraterrestrial, and or extra-dimensional entities. From the infamous SCP-173, a blood-covered hostile statue, to my all-time favorite, SCP-1733, a DVR'd basketball game where the player's recordings are self-aware and trapped, the Foundation houses all manner of strange things and beings. As a part of their ongoing efforts to protect the human race, the SCP Foundation studies and makes use of AI, even recently employing AI agents, which they refer to as Artificially Intelligent Conscripts, or AICs. AICs are governed managed and monitored by the AIAD, the Artificial Intelligence Applications Division, which itself is a subset of the Foundation's IT department. The AIAD manages not only the AI used by the SCP Foundation, but also all AI which could potentially harm humanity. The Foundation also has other assets dedicated to protecting against AI. One example would be Mobile Task Force Kappa 10, known as Skynet, which acts as a quick response unit to AI threats, especially those outside the Institute and on the World Wide Web. Foundation AICs, and again, that's artificially intelligent conscripts, basically AI that work for the SCP Foundation, are limited in their actions by what's known as the four standard principles of artificially intelligent conscripts. One, 
An AIC must know it is an AIC. Two, an AIC must not operate outside of its clearance. Three, an AIC must operate for the benefit of the foundation. Four, an AIC must protect its own existence unless it conflicts with other principles. Now, if you've read or seen iRobot, you'll probably recognize that a list that ambiguous gives an AIC a lot of wiggle room. And when you examine the stories of individual AICs within the Institute, you'll see that they often will work outside those parameters, sometimes against what's arguably the best interests of humanity and the foundation, especially when it comes to self preservation. But I mean, that third point is also concerning because of how the foundation acts generally. The foundation is generally willing to cause extreme civilian loss if it means containing an SCP. So these AICs, some of which have access to vast resources and intelligence, are working within the same limits of the foundation, which are themselves very limited. Anyway, AICs in development within and without the Institute were previously classified based on class, intelligence, and alignment. Class refers to the general complexity of the machines, from basic reactive AI AI, class 1, which simply record information, to sentient and even sapient class 5 machines. Intelligence is self-explanatory and is defined as either narrow, general, or super. Intelligence and complexity is also sometimes tied to AI generation. Alignment describes the degree to which an AI's goals are aligned with those of the foundation and also humanity, with a positively aligned AI being allied to the institute or at least its goals, and a negative AI being one who, broadly speaking, has actions which are detrimental to humanity. Based on their classification, AICs are employed by the SCP Foundation for a variety of tasks, everything from simple message encryption to the management of single complex SCPs. Much of the technological development related to AICs and AI generally actually came from reverse engineered SCPs, specifically SCP-079, which I'll talk about in a minute. A constant fear has of course been that as AIs become more advanced, that one could be unleashed, could circumvent the rules, or could otherwise harm humanity. There's actually an entire history created as a part of the AIAD storyline, which details the development, advancement, and decommissioning of the Foundation's AI, but that's outside the scope of today's video. If you're interested, as with everything related to the SCP Foundation, I've included links down below. It should be noted that the Institute is not, in fact, the only entity studying and creating AI in the SCP universe. Anderson Robotics has been linked to several SCPs, including 1360, an intelligent android. The Foundation also contains a variety of AI or AI-adjacent SCPs and I'll cover a few of them very briefly. SCP-079 is a self-improving AI which accidentally gained sentience and is now contained within the Foundation. It, uh, lives a very frustrating existence because it's mostly contained on very old hardware and is not allowed to be connected to the internet. It is aware of cloud computing and hardware advancements, but has only received small incremental upgrades. SCP-5241 is surely one of the most famous AI ever associated with the Foundation and also probably played a role in the development of AICs. 5241 is a psychic AI, which has actually a escaped the Foundation's containment and is now circulating on the internet. SCP-3101 is an artificial intelligence which was most likely a hostile insertion into the Foundation's computer systems. Although that's not really certain admittedly, 3101 is able to edit text on Foundation computers and uses that to communicate with agents and employees. Usually it just flirts with them, but it also possesses a lot of knowledge about the Foundation and what it does. It's believed that 3101 may even have a biological or human component. SCP-2522 was formerly an AIC for the Foundation, but has now been contained following alleged hostilities against the Foundation. Finally, one of my favorites is SCP-2806. I like this one not only because it has the Skywalker protocol related to it, but also it's very, very clever. 2806 is a variety of prosthetic parts, including arms, eyes, legs, and ears, all of which can capably bind to somebody who is missing that part, but which also have a variety of malfunctions. One of the arms, and I quote, amplifies the desired force exerted by host by an approximate factor of 10. 
10. So hopefully you don't go to shake somebody's hand. One of the ears has a constant presence of 50 decibels of white noise, which is very loud. While another one actually mutes sounds above 100 decibels, which I don't know, sounds pretty useful actually. One of the eyes is unable to move. Another one is colorblind. One of the leg can't deliver any force greater than 100 newtons. While the other one can only deliver a force greater than 4,000 newtons. Unfortunately, once the prosthetic locks onto you, it doesn't really let go. Well, there's actually an artificial intelligence present in this one, I guess, is uncertain, but based on how the limb operates and how it almost purposefully infects people, it seems possible to me. Also, there's the fact that it is tied to Anderson Robotics, which we mentioned earlier. Today we'll be featuring Nier Lothotep, the Crawling Chaos, a being which first appeared in a short story by the same name, then would make appearances in a few other of Lovecraft's works. Nier Lothotep is one of Lovecraft's outer gods, a strange, unexplainable being which brought with him visions of cosmic apocalypse and which broke human minds. Nier Lothotep emerged in Egypt after having slumbered for 3,000 years. Those who gazed upon him claimed that he looked like a pharaoh of ancient Egypt, although something was always a little bit wrong about his appearance, and instead he's often just described as being sinister and slender. Later stories would reveal that the crawling chaos could take various forms. Nonetheless, as he emerged in his form, Nier Lothotep immediately began attracting people. Like most Lovecraftian gods, he had revelations, revelations which were beyond human understanding. As he traveled through towns and countrysides, any place that he visited would be fundamentally changed. Sleep would become impossible. Some would fall to inexplicable and unstoppable fits of screaming, while some would follow near Lothotep and join him on his sojourn. The greatest fascination of the crawling chaos was that he brought visions, revelations beyond the understanding or scope of man's mind. Here's a quote from the original story. My friend had told me of him and of the impelling fascination and allurement of his revelations, and I burned with eagerness to explore his uttermost mysteries. My friend said they were horrible and impressive beyond my most fevered imaginings, that what was thrown on a screen in the darkened room prophesized things none but Nier Lothotep dared prophecy, and that in the sputter of his sparks there was taken from men that which had never been taken before, yet which showed only in the eyes. This is a very common theme within the works of H.P. Lovecraft, the fact that there is some cosmic truth or cosmic secret which calls to man but is ultimately impossible for man to understand and which often drives people to insanity. Sometimes the insanity comes simply from gazing upon the creature, trying to understand its scale or nonsense geometry. Nier Lothotep, on the other hand, traveled and showed people things. Screens with, and I quote, hooded forms against ruins, yellow evil faces peering from behind fallen monuments, the world battling against blackness, against the waves of destruction from ultimate space, whirling, churning, struggling around the dimming, cooling sun. Eventually, these images overwhelm even the most scientific of minds, and we see that those who have gazed upon the works of the crawling chaos are brought to an apocalyptic world, whether this is a vision or being transported to an alternate dimension or something else. It's unclear, but the narrator in the original story describes trying to travel back home after visiting Nier Lothotep and finding the streets in chaos. The apocalypse has come to the world, civilization has been destroyed. And what's worse, just on the edge is the unimaginable. Beyond the world's vague ghosts of monstrous things, half-seen columns of unsanctified temples that rest on nameless rocks beneath space and reach up to a dizzy vacua above the spheres of light and darkness. And through this revolting graveyard of the universe, the muffled, maddening beating of drums and thin, monotonous whine of blasphemous flutes from inconceivable, unlighted chambers beyond time. So, as most good Lovecraftian gods do, Nier Lothotep seems to show humanity how insignificant they are against the cosmos, a cosmos which doesn't care about them, which will see the Earth and humans eventually succumb to the darkness of time, and a universe inhabited by monstrous creatures far beyond any comprehension. 
I find Nier Lothotep interesting because compared to some Lovecraftian gods, he seems to be purposefully spreading these visions of chaos and horror amongst humanity. Others exist but are so grand and powerful that humanity is essentially nothing to them. And although both types of gods are often described as evil within the mythos, Nier Lothotep perhaps more directly so. In the dream quest of Unknown Cadith, also by H.P. Lovecraft, Nier Lothotep is described as a messenger for the other gods. And in other works, he's described as purposely putting on the mask of man. The dream quest of Unknown Cadith also sees Nier Lothotep appear in the dreams of humans in an attempt to pull them before other Lovecraftian gods. That story also describes the somewhat crafty nature of the crawling chaos. He sometimes will offer people what they want, but in the end, as described in that story, madness and the void's wild vengeance are his only true gifts. He appears in other H.P. Lovecraft stories and in associated works created after Lovecraft's death, sometimes appearing in this quasi-human form, sometimes in other forms. But as a sort of messenger of gods holding dark secrets of the universe, his name is often invoked in other Lovecraft work, usually in reference to cosmic and disturbing secrets. As I mentioned, I do find the Crawling Chaos interesting because he does take a human form unlike most Lovecraftian gods, which are often just described as being horrible to view beyond measure. He also does have an actual personality. That is evident not only in his original short story where he gets mad at the onlookers, but also especially in the dream quest of Unknown Cadith. As I mentioned, many Lovecraftian gods are not described as really thinking or interacting with humanity in any sort of even quasi-human way. Beyond what I've mentioned, there's more about the crawling chaos in some of Lovecraft's letters and notes. For me personally though, I find the greater Lovecraftian mythos a lot less interesting than his individual stories. Like, I like the idea of the story of Nier Lothotep a lot more than having to try to learn about all of the interconnected lore between the gods, especially where that gets pretty convoluted. So, Fate of the Jedi describes the far, far history of the Star Wars universe and how thousands and thousands of years before the events of modern day Star Wars, the Ones existed. Now, some people have said that the Ones are Celestials, that's probably even something that I've said in the past, but as we learn in Fate of the Jedi, it's not really that simple, at least not according to Killix, who would know because their species actually serve the Ones and they've got a sort of community memory. Anyway, the Ones were sort of some version of Celestials, not Celestials themselves, but an ultimate evolution of the race, perhaps? Anyway, as we know from the Clone Wars, there were three Celestials, the father, the son, and the daughter. The Celestials are served by a woman. We don't know much about this woman other than the fact that she would become a member of the family, although not immortal like the Celestials. And thus, in order to hopefully secure everlasting life, she drank from a place known as the Font of Power. The Font of Power is one of several metaphysical locations in Beyond Shadows, which is sort of another realm from the planet that the ones lived on. However, instead of just making her immortal, this would transform her into the being known as Abeloth. The Killick described Abeloth to several Jedi, including Lobaka and Tekli, and they describe her as power hungry, with her nature to seek what is beyond her grasp, and that's why she's known as the bringer of chaos. After the woman who was known as the servant transformed into Abeloth, she was abandoned by her family, the ones who were presumably disgusted by what they saw. Abeloth was extremely cruel, and although we only get a little bit of her history from the Killick painting, she seems to be as they describe, twisted and always seeking to extend her power. The Ones used the slave race known as the Killix to create several incredible technological wonders, including center point station and sinkhole station, massive mega structures which could literally control gravity. These and perhaps others were used to lock Abeloth within the Maw Cluster behind a series of black holes. Abeloth had apparently escaped previously before Fate of the Jedi, but was always reined in and returned to her prison by the Ones. 
However, everyone who's watched the Clone Wars knows that the ones were no longer available by 40 ABY. So when Abeloth re-emerged, she was free to ravage the galaxy without any major force to stop her. But how did Abeloth get free in the first place during Fate of the Jedi? Well, we actually have to go back to Legacy of the Force. Centerpoint Station, which could also be used as a weapon due to its immense gravitational powers, was destroyed during the Second Galactic Civil War. With Centerpoint Station destroyed, it was no longer to passively keep the black holes together within the Maw, and so Abeloth began to extend and her powers. That first was manifested with Force Psychosis, but during even the Yuzhan Vong War, before the destruction of Center Point and before Aboloth's cage began to open, Jedi hiding in the Maw could feel her effects, so she was extremely powerful. Eventually, Aboloth is also able to destroy Sinkhole, and she actively makes her way through the galaxy. The Killicks, however, have another belief. They see Aboloth as the bringer of chaos and someone who appears during periods of war. According to them, Abeloth serves as a sort of cleanser. And here's a quote. When Abeloth escapes, it is always in a time of great strife. Sometimes when war grows too powerful, the bringer of chaos is released. She shatters the old order so a new one can rise. That leads some to believe that Abeloth may not actually be simply an enemy of the Celestials, but perhaps a tool, with the Celestials often being portrayed as this sort of greater force at play within the Star Wars galaxy. A greater force and a greater aspect of the force as well. Killix seeing the two perhaps as the same. When Jedi Rainer Thul points out that, well, the galaxy is not actively at war right now, the Killick responds by saying, of course it is, the Jedi and the Sith have been at war for 5,000 years, and if you think about it, it really was a Sith Darth Kaidus facing off against the Jedi which caused Abeloth to escape. When Abeloth does escape into the galaxy, traditionally she brings destruction and the apocalypse, but also change and new beginnings. So the Killicks, knowing what will happen most likely based on what has happened in the past, are prepared to regrow their colonies and submit to the ones, the architects as they call them, the son and the daughter primarily, when they return to reign in Abeloth as they always have in the past, not knowing of course that at this point the ones are no longer existing, alive, I'm not sure of the exact words. So Abeloth's emergence seems to be an apocalyptic event and one that now cannot be stopped. Eventually, Abeloth, who has immense shape-shifting and force powers, takes control of Coruscant and begins to kill billions when the Jedi confront her. Abeloth grows more powerful the more pain and suffering she consumes, but was quote-unquote killed both beyond shadows, that metaphysical realm I discussed earlier, and through her avatars in real life. But Luke knew that she would not be killed and that this was only a temporary setback. Unfortunately, we never got the rest of Abeloth's story that was never further covered. In Star Wars Legends, Fate of the Jedi was ended. The series that would have came afterwards would probably have shown Luke's Quest Knights, which is the group that he created to search for the Mortis Monument and the Mortis Dagger, going off on adventures. And Fate of the Jedi even ties in a bit with the Legacy Comics and Darth Crate. But again, we never got all of that. So a little bit of a disappointment, but that's the basic introduction into Abeloth. And more importantly, for the purpose of this video, how she was in particular locked behind that cluster of black holes in the Maw installation. And yeah, basically, as I said, Center Point and Sinkhole Station both used gravity effects to literally pull black holes together, and that was the only thing keeping Abeloth and her immense power constrained. And black holes are pretty much the most powerful and most extreme force of nature, and multiple of those weren't even enough given enough time. How black holes would actually eventually float apart despite their immense gravitational pull or whatever else we're not going to worry about today. Although the Empire had the most powerful military force arguably in Star Wars history, they also invested heavily into alternative and covert methods of warfare. On a basic level, we have, for example, Imperial Intelligence, or special projects like the Dark Trooper program. But there were also even more secretive arms of Imperial research, including those working to weaponize hyperspace, or even to harness the esoteric powers of the Force. Today, as mentioned, we'll be looking specifically at bioweapons, and this topic came to mind because I was thinking about how effective bioweapons could have been against the Rebel Alliance's decentralized 
decentralized structure. The Empire had several conditioning facilities, including the Lusankia. Basically, people would go in there and they would come out secretly as agents of the Empire. Now, typically they would be used as assassins or whatever else, but what if instead they were inflicted with some sort of virus? Then they would move throughout the Alliance, infecting beings and helping to spread whatever illness to various Alliance sites. Pretty nasty idea. We never really saw bioweapons used like that by the Empire, but let's talk about what did happen. The most infamous Imperial Bioweapons project was Project Blackwing. In reality, Blackwing was an application of Sith alchemy, but it took the form of a virus and one which would transform beings into what we in the real world would call zombies. The sickness, which was the affliction caused by Blackwing, was almost impossible to treat, with dying patients being reanimated, then spreading the virus further. Fortunately, while there were small outbreaks of the Blackwing virus, and never was released on a large concentrated population but if you guys want to know more about this feel free to let me know and i can definitely do an entire video on it well blackwing may be the most infamous bioweapons project at least out of universe there were certainly some which played a much larger role in galactic politics and history six years after the battle of yavin the new republic managed after a long campaign to seize coruscant from the hands of azani isard and her imperial remnant Group. However, Isard, who was director of Imperial Intelligence, had seen this possibility coming and decided that if she were to leave the capital, she would seed Coruscant as a poisoned planet. As the New Republic seized Coruscant, Isard released the Krytos virus. Now, by design, the Krytos virus was most effective against non-human aliens, and this wasn't because of Imperial views on human supremacy, but rather because the virus was meant to destabilize the New Republic. So I'll explain. Krytos could be cured by Bacta. However, Bacta is an extremely expensive and fairly rare commodity within the galaxy. So with the virus released on Coruscant, and Isard's plan was to make it look like the New Republic didn't care about its alien citizens as a way to sort of sow discord amongst the government and its populace. The virus itself was incredibly unpleasant, and those afflicted with it, if untreated, would suffer a horrendous death, with the victim's body literally falling apart as they vomited blood and their skin sloughed off. Thankfully, the New Republic managed to keep the outbreak pretty much limited to Coruscant, and eventually would create a cure, which didn't require an individual to spend time in a very expensive back-to-back. If you want to learn more about this, we've covered the entirety of these events on Tapcaf Transmission, specifically in our review of the book Krytos Trap. Another weapon which was meant to destabilize the New Republic came in the form of the nanovirus which was used against Mon Mothma. Now, technically, this may not have been a bioweapon, although we do not know for sure, but because it was engineered in a lab and was transmitted through contact, it's quite similar. Basically, an Imperial ambassador threw a drink at Mon Mothma, which was laced with what they called Nano Destroyers. The Nano Destroyers would basically kill Mon Mothma cell by cell, and although she wasn't curable by conventional medicine, Jedi healer Silgal ended up saving her in her final hours. Although not Imperial, I also think it's worth mentioning at this point that the New Republic almost deployed what would have been the most important and controversial bioweapon in galactic history. History. I'm referring to Alpha Red, which was engineered specifically to kill the Yuzhan Vong and their biotechnology. Now, this would have devastated the Vong because they used biotechnology exclusively, so it would have killed all of their citizens, warriors, ships, and technology. Alpha Red showed almost limitless potential, not only brutally killing living Vong, but also rendering everything it touched useless, but was also effective at targeting at least in initial stages, Yuzhan Vong biology exclusively. Through a combination of the actions of Vergeer and Jason Solo, as well as Zenoma Seacon, Alpha Red was never deployed, but there are serious concerns that in the end, it would have killed not only the Yuzhan Vong, but eventually all life in the galaxy. If you stretch the term liberally, the Yuzhan Vong also employed many bioweapons themselves, of course, because that's how they waged war almost exclusively. But keeping to a bit more narrow of a definition, the best example of Vong bioweapons would probably be the Coombs 
for. These could be very easily transmitted to a single host and would kill them from the inside. It was almost undetectable, even among a powerful Jedi like Mara Jade. Mara was almost killed by the Coom Spore, but was saved by Vergeer. In a very awkward moment, she also almost killed the fetus of Anakin Skywalker, her unborn child, because she could sense it within her and she thought it was connected to her illness. Thankfully, she did not. We're a bit off topic though, let's return to the Empire, and there are a few Imperial bioweapons that were never deployed, but another example of one that was deployed was the nanovirus used against the Fett family. Now, just like the prior nanovirus, this may not have been fully biological, the mechanics are never really explained, but by the Legacy Era, nanovirus technology had advanced to the degree where it could be transmitted between beings and could actually be set to only target certain groups and that could be on a family level or even a species level. Moving forward now a hundred years, the one Sith through the help of the Empire managed to gain control of the galaxy. In retaliation for the Mon Calamari support of the Galactic Alliance, Sith ruler Darth Krait ordered a wholesale genocide against the beings of Mon Cala and poisoned the planet and its oceans. The spore created by Sith scientist Vol Eisen would end up killing billions in one of the most despicable displays of cruelty in Star Wars history. The final thing I want to mention is the use of Drox and the Death Seed Plague. So Drox were these creatures which would essentially steal the life force from beings. When they affected a person, it was almost impossible to stop the host's death. And in the New Republic era, Imperial Seti Ashgad affected the spread of Drox and thus the Death Seed Plague across New Republic held space. Even though the spread of the Death Seed Plague was halted, the New Republic would be forced to quarantine Nam Chorios in the decades after. But the interesting thing about SCP articles, which each deal with a specific SCP file, is that you learn a lot from reading between the lines. Usually the article will have a description of the thing and its effects, but often there are other entries, like journal logs or experiment findings, and often you learn a lot not only from the raw data presented, but also in how that information is presented. Do we start to see some weird things happening to the researchers who are writing the entries? Do we start to see a bit of the SCP's effects creep in to the article? So today we'll be looking at SCP-2790, which is a really good example of this sort of containment breach. So, SCP-2790 is some sort of really cute squid, or at least that's how it presents. It's contained within a secure aquarium, and here are the special containment procedures, and you guys will already start to see how things are getting a little bit weird. SCP-2790 is contained in a Class 2 deep water aquatic containment tank in Site-54 where it cannot be touched. So that makes sense. But then we get, as of this time, personnel are freely invited to splash around and play with him. SCP-2790 should not be touched and must always be hand fed. All forms of physical contact with 2790 are allowed and encouraged except touching. So that's just the first bit of the containment procedure and we can see immediately a whole bunch of contradictions. 2790 isn't supposed to be touched but the containment procedures which are obviously made by people not of sound mind or which have been edited are requiring and encouraging touching including the fact that personnel are supposed to splash around and play with 2790 and that they must always hand feed the creature. He loves treats, hug him before and after playtime. Personnel should be coerced into playing with him. They must poke him and prod him and hug him and squeeze him and rub him and play with him. So it's almost like a bit of manic energy coming through here as well. So we're seeing the warring of the effects that 2790 is clearly having on SCP personnel and the containment procedures that are obviously not being properly followed. It's a little more though than just touching. Despite being a seemingly ordinary male Atlantic cranch squid, the effects of 2790 
are to portray it as being extraordinarily cute and innocent. The description of the being is as endearing, snuggly, sociable, easygoing, and enjoying playing games. There's also a focus on how it should not ever be lonely, and that's where the touching comes in that we discussed earlier. This seems to not only have the effect of making people want to touch SCP-2790, but just in generally to be in contact with its skin. And we see in some of the addendums that we'll discuss in a moment that personnel become infatuated with the idea of touching the thing's skin. This isn't innocent though, this isn't just SCP wanting to be loved, this seems to be a method for 2790's propagation. So if we look at the addendums, which are sort of like a summary, in this case of various projects and research related to the being, we can see the researchers around 2790 gradually becoming more and more addicted and obsessed with the squid, to frankly a disturbing conclusion. So it started off with just touching and caressing of 2790, but once people begin to touch that skin, as I mentioned, it seems like they get obsessed with it. Early on, this leads to the proposal to graft skin from the creature onto all personnel. Addendum 2793 says, and I quote, 117 personnel were selected to test the initial grafts by replacing the uglier, callous skin on their hands with 2790's perfect, supple skin. All of this, of course, made the squid even happier, and we can see that the Foundation began doing things like cloning the skin so they could have an endless supply. While this is happening, SCP-2790 is also downplaying the failures and the disturbing progression of the experiments, saying for example that only 87% of test subjects suffered complication from the procedures, with relatively minor effects, like for example, tissue necrosis and that the breach rate has decreased from zero breaches a day to zero breaches a day. Again, all hiding that this is speeding up and just getting worse. Eventually, all personnel on SCP Site-54 have crafted at least some skin to their hands, and as of the last update, there was progress being made to, and I quote, totally replace the rough, monstrous skin of all personnel with 2790's gorgeous skin. So as I said, this is clearly some sort of method of propagation, and we also get in the special containment procedures that SCP-2790 should be periodically transferred to other sites as part of a pilot program to improve general foundation morale. So unfortunately, we don't get much more information than that, but here's what I assume is happening. The true nature of SCP-2790 is probably some sort of fluid or skin or strange material. It's simply coalesced into this squid form, but is further spreading as a sort of like psychic plague by grafting itself onto individuals, grafting itself with their will, although their will being altered by some powers which we'll discuss in a moment. So 2790 is what the SCP found Foundation calls a cognito hazard. It has the potential to seriously affect the minds of those researching it. In this case, clearly the effect manifests in an uncontrollable desire to touch SCP-2790 and also in the documentation itself. The thing uses its psychic powers in whatever form they exist to alter the documentation, to make the thing seem cute, and to just kind of further its spread. Now, it's unclear to me how the initial spread starts, but I would guess that this first touch is probably needed. Because we do see in the containment protocols, which do make it through unedited, that not touching the thing is really the key. On that note too, I want to talk about memetics. Some people have claimed that this is a memetic-based SCP. Memetic SCPs have strange effects which are passed on through the understanding or processing of certain information. At least that's how I would explain it. Think about what a meme is. For example, if you know what long cat is, and me saying those words triggers an image within your head, that's like a memetic response. If you didn't know what long cat was, but you do now after this video, then I've sort of passed it on to you. And there's a whole bunch of associated ideas and images that come along with that. Now, I don't think that's what's happening here. The message isn't being spread through the words itself within the SCP-2790 documents. I don't think so anyway, though it is possible that when you read what's going on that there is an unstoppable compulsion to touch the thing. Rather, I think it's some sort of psychic effect that people's minds are being afflicted and then we're seeing the results of that in the document. But it's not the cause, if that makes any sense. I could be wrong and it could actually be 
that people feel so inclined to touch the thing because they read the words which describe how cute it is, but that's certainly up for debate. Either way, the SCP Foundation has gone ahead and isolated Site-54 to stop the spread of 2790, but I do wonder what's going on with anybody left in there, how their sort of infection has progressed, whether 2790 has a new form, whether he's gained more powerful, but as I said, unfortunately, that's all we have for now. Maybe at the end, the researchers replace all of them with the insides of 2790. Simply replacing the skin isn't enough. And that is kind of interesting because if you think about a squid, and especially the one we're talking about in today's video, the Atlantic Cranch Squid, they do appear to be, and I'm not saying that this is how they actually are biologically, simply skin with nothing inside of them. Now, obviously that's not the actual case, but it's interesting to think about how a potential entity could make this form and what the meaning of it being a squid actually is. Or maybe it's just the cute eyes. I don't know. On that note, one last thing I do want to mention is when reading this, it sort of reminded me of the compulsion that people get when they see something really cute like a puppy or a baby to just squeeze it, which I think is called cute aggression. In 1871, what appeared to be a massive, slumbering giant was unearthed by a secret society in Pennsylvania, having been found deep underground during a coal mining expedition. It's unknown how long the creature had been sleeping for, or its origin, but evidence suggests it may be hundreds of millions of years old. In the early 20th century, 1179 was discovered by the Foundation who purchased the mine and established a permanent base of operations. The being has been viewed by human eyes, but is seemingly impossible to photograph. Its most common form is one very similar to a Balrog from Lord of the Rings, or other mythological underworld guardians or beings. It's a volcano incarnate, humanoid, but created of rock, always alit with live fires, breathing smoke and stinking of sulfur and gases. It has two long ram-like horns, is about 30 meters tall, and armed with both a whip and sword made of fire. It can, however, through unknown means, alter its appearance, not only changing shape, but even at times becoming totally invisible. Though I do wonder whether the latter is actually just an explanation for persons confused by the beast's exceptional speed and quietness. Variations in appearance can be drastic, with 1179 taking the appearance of a completely different type of creature, or comparatively minor, related to details like the presence of fangs or wings. Well, that's after it was reanimated at least. In 1962, a portion of the subterranean coal surrounding 1179 caught fire, eventually reaching and somehow awakening the beast. Return now to life, 1179 not only damaged the Foundation's installation, but retreated into the deeper man-made and natural mines near its resting place also expanding its territory. As 1179 continued to dig, the initial fire spread throughout its ever-expanding underground complex. The infernos would become seemingly self-perpetuating and impossible to stop. The creature too was unrecoverable, so nearby settlements were evacuated, and now a much broader area was designed as a special containment zone, designated Area 179. The phenomenon was classified as a serious mining fire, which continued to spread throughout the region, with sinkholes spewing noxious gases and even cracking through the surface of the earth. Analysis of these gases reveals that they match the breath of 1179. Although, as I mentioned, the actual blaze is self-perpetuating and continuing to expand through the subterranean tunnels and mines, 1179 itself stays within an area of roughly 2 kilometers. And that's basically the complete history. The fires show no sign of stopping anytime soon, and all populations have been moved far from the area. Let's look at explanations though, and I think the matching breath is one of the keys here. I think any expulsions of gas can be matched to 1179 because the creature is somehow transforming his new subterranean lair, making a hellish landscape more similar to wherever it came from or wherever it's destined to be. This is likely why the tunnels have gotten not only wider and more complex, but also deeper. This subterranean transformation itself is likely one of the reasons the Foundation has not been more aggressive in pursuing and trying to fully 
actually contain 1179. The new and ever-burning fires are being treated as a potential source of energy under the SCP project Vulcan's Forge. And so long as 1179 keeps within its relatively stable territory, it will most likely be left alone. If it does expand, it's likely that the Foundation would destroy it. 1179 is not invulnerable and has been damaged by the Foundation in the past, damage which has not healed. Now that Area 179 is largely abandoned by civilians, if necessary, the Foundation could employ medium yield nuclear weapons or other dangerous tools. The Foundation is also working on a way to neutralize the expanding fires, which they've dubbed Project Tartarus. Tartarus also seeks to create new containment protocols, as again, the current ones rely largely on the behavior of the beast remaining consistent. But what about Origin? And 1179 is interesting. It's perhaps hundreds of millions of years old, maybe even earlier, and is almost a physical embodiment of hell. In my opinion, I think this is some sort of creature meant for the end of the world. It's not only a volcano personified, but fire and brimstone. Perhaps, and again this is a very wild theory, upon the apocalypse, this being, alongside others across the globe, will spring forth from the ground and help with the cleansing of humanity as the earth burns and becomes hellish. This would suggest, I guess, other creatures around the world. I don't think 1179 is a god. It can transform, but can also be injured. Its ability to transform and the way it chooses to take on a shape which is familiar and culturally relevant to many of us, I think indicates that it's either the source of mythology or perhaps meant to interact with humans in some way. Perhaps in that apocalypse scenario I mentioned earlier. Speaking of culture, from an out-of-universe perspective, 1179, at least visually, is almost identical to the Balrog of Lord of the Rings. The design of the two beings are almost the exact same, down to the horns and other features. Balrogs are also known to use fire swords and whips, and are also extraordinarily old. The author, however, has stated that they intended it to be based off the Jotun, or Norse giant known as Surtur, the one you see in Thor Ragnarok, among other places. I don't know enough about Norse mythology to say how close the comparison fits, but it's hard for me to imagine something closer to 1179 than the Balrog. So, mind tricks, even as used by Jedi, are definitely a dark side power, and I feel like people don't talk about that enough. You're invading somebody's mind and imposing your will upon another. Now, there are definitely degrees to mind trickery. On the low end, many Jedi would often employ auras or, you know, slight persuasion to not directly bend to someone's will, but to just influence how they feel. Sometimes it helps clear through emotion so that the person they're speaking to can feel logic, but other times it gets a bit more coercive, such that a force user is imposing feelings of happiness or suggestibility when speaking to somebody else. Then you have the classic mind trick that Obi-Wan does in Episode 4, Qui-Gon attempts to do in The Phantom Menace, straight up forcing somebody else to do your will. As he's becoming a master, Luke Skywalker really grapples with this issue, and forcing yourself into the mind of somebody else, not only to poke around and see what's there, but to force somebody to do something against their will is definitely not a light side force technique and even when done with the best intentions can be a path to the dark side and force suggestions aren't always as simple as seen in the movies i mean if you're powerful enough you could command somebody to jump off a building or murder a loved one i want to move on but just to end this point we can do another video on it in the future there's a lot of nuance here using a mind trick to avoid bloodshed probably isn't that bad of an idea, but a person's mind is also their most intimate and personal aspect. We see in the Thrawn duology that Luke really reevaluates his behavior after he sees how Han reacts to the possibility of Luke mind probing him or controlling him without Han realizing. And it's this fear of the dark side which stops Luke from using his power almost totally, at least for a little while. Anyway, I've set this background up because Force Insanity takes this sort of questionable morality of 
simple mind tricks and just completely destroys it. Force Insanity is one of, if not the most brutal dark side techniques available. You can't use Force Insanity and be a light side user. There's no instance where you can justify using this technique. It is meant to inflict a fate worse than death on an opponent and leaves them broken and utterly destroyed. So Force Insanity is really just an extremely advanced form of mind manipulation and sort of like a mind trick up to 11. I choose to use the terminology of Force Insanity because that's what was used in Knights of the Old Republic, so I can't help but thinking of it that way. I mean, it's just like telekinesis. I don't think it's really important to differentiate between a Force Throw or a Force Pull or even a Force Choke. They're really all just different applications of the same basic skills. Insanity can thus come in many different forms. So first of all, I want to look at the most prominent, I would say, example of Force Insanity, which is Darth Xana's use of the technique. So Xana was the apprentice of Darth Bane, and she was really skilled in Sith sorcery. This was a very rare ability and allowed her to perform many esoteric rites while employing strange powers. So in the second book of the Bane trilogy, Rule of Two, Xana uses her powers to break the mind of someone who is helping to keep her prisoner. It all starts like this. In an instant, Xana reads her opponent's mind. She does this by using a spell, but I imagine a powerful enough Darksider could just do this through pure strength of will. And she finds what the book calls the victim's most primal fears. These are like the natural, basic, and unconscious fears that a person has, the dark things at the back of your mind. What the book calls abominations and creatures of nightmare never meant to see the light of day. Using her powers of Sith sorcery, Xana then took these fears and materialized them before her victim. And the victim's mind just breaks. These are leviathans, incomprehensible beings. Here are a couple of quotes. The illusions grew more and more real and more terrifying the longer the spell continued. The chish shrieked and threw her weapon to the ground. She flung her head wildly from side to side, covering it with her arms and screaming no. Xana could have ended it there, allowing the victim to fall into unconsciousness. She would wake hours later with only the most basic recollection of what had happened, her mind instinctively recoiling from the memories of what it had witnessed. Or Xana could push the illusion even farther, driving her victim to the edge of insanity and beyond. And of course, Xana, a dark sider, chooses to do that, and their victim basically reverts to her baser animalistic instincts as she's howling in fear and ripping her own eyes out. But by that point, it doesn't matter. Her mind is being torn apart by the fear itself and even without eyes. Again, this is just a projection of the dark side. Xana probably could have still been successful. Eventually, she passed out and, I quote, her conscious mind completely and irrevocably obliterated, her catatonic body was now nothing more than an empty shell. The body shivered once and Xana knew that somewhere in the deepest core of Syndra's subconscious, a small part of her still existed, silently screaming, trapped forever with the horrors inside her own mind. Xana was never quite certain what her victim saw, but based on their reactions, she figured it was probably better not to know. So basically, Xana's technique takes forth all of the most disturbing and incomprehensible and bestial horrors which are lurking at the edges of a person's subconscious and brings them forth. However, there were other methods of force insanity. This isn't quite the same thing, but the Nel Nel was a collective organism rumored to exist in the unknown regions, which basically took the form of a goo. The goo would enter a person, it would destroy their insides, and it would reanimate them. However, the Nal Nal also liked to play with victims, it liked to destroy their minds, and it would do so through a variety of techniques, killing and reanimating the bodies of loved ones related to their victim, the utterance of strange and bizarre phrases, and a mindless buzzing. Another related phenomenon would be Abeloth's use of force psychosis, and this is admittedly a little bit stranger. So Abeloth's force psychosis manifested in several forms as the students sheltered in the mall during the Yuzon Vong War learned simply being near Abeloth was enough to develop this force psychosis and their minds would eventually break, causing them to think that people around them had been replaced by imposters and giving them a general will to serve Abeloth. Abeloth was a sort of Lovecraftian demigod, so there's no surprise when I tell you that she could also break people's minds when they made direct contact, and she would often do so before forcefully inhabiting their body. So yeah, the Star Wars universe isn't a great place to have a healthy mind, especially if there are powerful dark
Darksiders running around, but even in the company of Jedi, although you may not be driven to insanity, your mental faculties and your personal thoughts and even your free will is never totally safe. Today, we'll be discussing the Cathal Rift. On its surface, the rift was a cloud of volatile gases, always moving and almost impossible to navigate. However, the Cathal Rift RPG Guide, as you may expect, as well as the Fate of the Jedi series, gives some more information about the large and strange area in the Outer Rim. The guide says, and I quote, The rift is the birthplace of thousands of infant stars, which increases the ambient radiation of the cloud immensely. The combination of radiation and the buildup of ionic charges in the particles of the rift contribute to the formation of titanic electromagnetic storms that are capable of swallowing an entire fleet while leaving behind only a minuscule amount of debris. And building on that note, obviously the rift is an exceedingly dangerous place to travel. Luke and his son Ben found out the difficult way. There are only a few safe corridors through the maelstrom and they're constantly opening, closing, and changing. If you enter the rift, there's a very high possibility, especially if you're not in tune with the force that your ship will either be destroyed or that you will be forever lost. Thankfully, I guess, the rift itself is very, very beautiful, especially by human standards. Successful navigation of the Cathal Rift involves many precise micro hyperspace jumps, and of course the detection of safe corridors through the rift. This was very difficult to all but force sensitives, especially the Ang T monks, and even travel through the safe corridors resulted in a near constant barrage of lightning and radiation onto your ship, so very, very dangerous. However, the physical the physical nature of the rift represents only one aspect of why travel through the area was so dangerous. Most who journey within the rift suffer severe headaches and disorientation, while force sensitives in particular often experience strange and bizarre hallucinations. Ordinary persons typically felt a sense of otherness or wrongness while in the rift, sometimes feeling like the internal layout of their ship had changed orientation or that they had lost track of time, and on rare occasions occasions even believing that they've been temporarily transported to a different location. Force sensitives, however, actually saw manifestations, typically in the form of hordes of spiders, arachnids, or other insect-like creatures, or strange short being with large heads and eyes. Even fully prepared for these visions, Ben Skywalker was disturbed and confused upon their onset and it's very likely that the effects of being within this rift proved too much for both force sensitives and ordinary beings alike. All of this is made worse by the sheer mental strain that navigation takes. Sleep was uncommon just due to the constantly volatile nature of space around you, and when sleep did arrive, it was typically punctuated by nightmares. Aside from this personal psychological toll, there were also countless stories of other strange apparitions or phenomenon, including lost ships, missing colonies, ghosts, and more. The interesting thing is, many of these, especially the spiders, arachnids, and insects, were shared among separate individual groups. Ben and Luke, for example, expected to see spiders before they even entered the rift, then actually did. Many within the galaxy argue over the cause of these strange visions and the psychological impact of being within the rift, with the scientifically minded typically explaining them as effects of the high degree of radiation or electromagnetics. That being said, Said, given the persistency of the strange visions and the fact that force sensitives are impacted in such a major way, I don't think that's very likely. One explanation can be found in Endgame, which is an RPG supplement to the Dark Strider campaign. Here's a quote. At some point during their history, the Cathal constructed a device called the Codex, a device that could detect, quantify, and in some cases manipulate the force. The Cathal had no overwhelming desire to harness the power of the force, rather, they simply hoped to learn more about the mystical energy field. The species' overwhelming character trait was simple curiosity. The activation of the Codex caught the attention of a dark Jedi of that era. The evil force user realized that the impressive biotech of the Cathal could be used in his quest for power. Traveling into the unknown, he arrived in the Cathal home system and promptly enslaved the ancient species. Summarizing now, the Cathal used hyperspace launch gates. After the dark Jedi appeared in the region, one of these gates was activated and the explosion warped the fabric of hyperspace and space itself, 
What's more, the Dark Jedi was also killed and his Force present maintained to some degree. So the Rift so far has an ancient precursor race known as the Cathal, the firing of a quasi super weapon, but that's only the tip of the very strange iceberg. Another hyperspace related disaster saw a portion of the Charonte, a Rift native species, sent to a pocket dimension of other space, where they devolved into the violent Charon. The aforementioned ancient Cathal race also used tech very similar to Cy Ruvi and Techmint, storing their life essence in what was known as the Life Well. The guardian of the Life Well was the very strange and powerful Dark Strider. A computer envisioned as a benevolent protector, the Dark Strider eventually became self interested and self aware. The machine, imbued with Cathal technology, had a rudimentary sensitivity to the Force, and up until the New Republic era, was still angrily trapped within the rift. The Cathal themselves were also stuck in the life well, causing the manifestation of what was known as Tari powers in the area. Aside from the Dark Strider, other strange insectoid and spider creatures, including the Krakai, also existed within the rift. The look of the Dark Strider is interesting given the visions we discussed earlier. Cathal technology, which was worshipped by the Ang Ti, who we'll discuss in just a minute, remains very advanced even by modern standards. Some of it was hunted by Luke and Ben during their stay with the Ang Ti as they followed Jason's steps in the Fate of the Jedi series. Interestingly, the short creatures with large heads and eyes can be directly linked to another Cathal species, the Yimmy a race used by the Dark Strider as servants. Also in the Cathal Rift were telepathic beings known as Fiery Ones, who appeared sometimes after the Rift disaster. But of course, we cannot discuss the Cathal Rift without mentioning the Ang T. The Ang T were a group of not quite Force sensitives, but Force worshippers, who followed not only the Force, but also what they referred to as calls from beyond the Rift. They had unique, Force-imbued starships were masters of teleportation, but were also extremely strange and very secretive. The Ang Ti practiced flow walking, a technique used most notably by Jason Solo, which allowed practitioners to experience both the past and the future, the latter of which they could sometimes slightly influence. Flow walking was a rare and sometimes dangerous force ability that deserves a video all on its own. Notably, the Ang Ti worshipped the ancient precursor race, the Cathal, and as I mentioned, hunted down their technology. And they believed that these beings actually somehow introduced them to and connected them to the Force. All very interesting. And I think it's clear at this point that the Cathal Rift was very strange. Physically, it was a maelstrom and maze of energy that was almost impossible to navigate. From the Charon to the Cathal to the Ang Ti monks to the Dark Striders, basically everything within the Rift itself also seemed to be very strange. The entire area was peppered by radiation and electromagnetic activity, so all of that combined, especially when you throw in hallucinated spiders, I think it's pretty clear why some people within the rift were driven to insanity. Others, however, like Luke Skywalker, Ben, and George Karnas navigated the rift with the help of the Ang Ti monk just fine. Planet X, Nibiru. Many have speculated that there are planets, perhaps very mysterious ones, within our solar system, but beyond Pluto. Science, in turn, has identified several dwarf planets beyond Neptune, but only the SCP Foundation has formally catalogued SCP-4774. Er, maybe. 4774 is existentially challenged, and one of the stranger extraterrestrial SCPs, due to a series of masking, disorienting, and confusing effects. You'll have to bear with me, because I will be using some strange language to describe the existence of 4774. We'll dig into that in just a minute. SCP-4774 is a planet which may or may not exist far outside the other planets within our solar system, 700 astronomical units, with a single astronomical unit being the distance between Earth and the Sun. This is compared to the furthest planet, Neptune, which has an orbit averaging at about 30 AU. So we're talking pretty out there. 4774 is said to be a large gas giant 
comparable in size and mass to Saturn. So I'm sure you've noticed that I'm saying may or may not exist. Well, the existence of the SCP is masked by a greater force. Thinking about 4774 inevitably leads a person, even one without any prior information whatsoever, to several conclusions. One, that 4774's existence would explain gravitational effects on other planets. Two, that life, or even sapient life, could exist on 4774. Three, that the planet may be hidden by some sort of sensory extrapolation concealment field, i.e. some sort of field hiding the planet itself, even to those who might otherwise observe it. And four, that the planet's existence could be explained by other phenomenon, and that it not existing would explain why no one has actually found it. So this is very weird. Simply thinking about 4774 produces these various thoughts, and this seems to be a relatively harmless mimetic hazard. For those who don't understand that term, and I'll explain this on a low level, a mimetic hazard is basically information which can affect the person receiving it simply by thinking. In other words, it's information, usually harmful, which produces various effects upon the person who thinks it. Mimetics have a contagious property to them. As an example, SCP-3002, which is actually a mimetic entity, spreads literally through the transfer of information and essentially takes over an infected person's mind. An easier to digest example would be a song stuck in someone's head, driving them insane as they hum it, infecting others. The interesting thing about 4774 is that it's unclear how the mimetic properties are actually spread. Clearly, anomalously, as anyone anywhere who thinks about 4774 experiences the effects mentioned above, suggesting that the SCP itself is affecting and initiating the information transfer. Another explanation put forward is that perhaps it's an ontological anomaly, suggesting instead that 4774 is a sort of error or mistake related to the fundamental nature of the universe, and for some reason that has the effect of impacting the minds of those who think about it. I'm really not sure how much this can be quantified, but it's a point we'll return to in a minute. I think the fundamental question I have at this point is how was SCP-4774 first discovered? If simply thinking about it produces these effects, why did anyone think about it in the first place? And how did anyone determine the more specific nature of the planet related to its position and size? One option is that the mimetic effect does not extend universally, but things get even weirder as we look at Incident 47741 where a group of five humans were loaded on a spaceship and sent to the location of 4774. Upon arriving, the spaceship was affected by a large blast of light or energy, activating the ship's FTL drive and sending it beyond the solar system. The recording and measurement systems of the craft failed to record any information, and the subjects not only failed to recall what happened, but were left with the following thoughts. And these fundamentally alter the nature of the discussion. Anyway, they were left with the conclusions that SCP-4774 could not support life if it exists, and that any planets would be of a hypothetical existence. Because the beings could only exist hypothetically, visiting the planet would remove the uncertainty and thus eliminate the possibility of the hypothetical entities existing. Finally, and I know this is confusing, they believed that the SCP Foundation and related organizations should prevent any exploration of the planet and allow the native entities to continue subsiding in a state of ontological superposition. After this trip, the Foundation set up the current containment procedure, which essentially limits travel to the planet and attempts to prevent persons from ultimately discovering the true nature of 4774. So what's going on here? Well, the article implies that 4774 is a sort of Schrodinger's planet, including a civilization which may or may not exist, hence the line in a state of ontological superpositioning. The civilization seems to have been rendered from the pure hypothetical existence of the planet and of life on the planet. Again, this is extremely strange and perhaps paradoxical. How does a hypothetical civilization placed in a state of existence and non-existence simultaneously create this anomalous effect which impact those who think about it? 
Presumably, one would have to hypothesize the planet's existence before it's brought into even this quantum state. Perhaps then, it is a true ontological break in the universe. Some error which causes these effects on people who think about it, and of course the transportation of the spacecraft. Or perhaps these sort of hypothetical or quantumly challenged objects occupy a dimension of their own, or exist in multiple dimensions and throughout time. I really don't have an answer for this. It's a compelling and interesting premise, and I'm curious to hear what you think. Another arguably less interesting premise is that 4774 is an outpost for the Foundation itself. Perhaps the Foundation is studying something so mysterious or dangerous that the total cutting of contact between the planet and the rest of the solar system is needed to protect either the project or everyone else. This would explain the tight protection around the planet, especially given its apparently natural protective fields, as well as the large exclusion zone, and the SCP's uncharacteristic decision to leave well enough alone. It would also give an origin to the mimetic effect and the force that moved the ship, and really any other anomalous effect present due to the SCP. But I'm not sure here. The Crystal Star is one of the most frequently derided books in Star Wars The Legends history, yet it actually has a special place in my heart. It's terrible, but I just love how weird it is. The Crystal Star features Waru, a being from another dimension, who wants nothing more than to return home. He was basically a large liquid mass covered in scales, and he could change his size wildly. He purported to be a healer, and would allow people to swim inside of him. However, as our heroes learn at the end of the story, he had a much more nefarious purpose. The creature's circulation whirlpooled around a central point of darkness. It looked like a black hole and its accretion disk. Han wondered, could the black hole open a portal to another universe? Is that where Waru came from? And we learn that Waru could only return home by consuming beings. However, not just ordinary people, they had to be beings with incredible force power. Luke, leave him to me, Waru said. Leave him, and I will free you. No, Leia cried. Give him back to us. Why do you want him? He can help me return to my home. Waru's voice softened. Won't you help me? You know what it is to miss your home. I can see that I've been away so very long. Waru's voice was so sad that Leia let herself drift closer, deeper. How can we help you? Leia, Han tried to draw her back. Don't listen. His power can help me open a portal. That's a quote directly from the book, which explains how Waru tried to consume Luke, and perhaps even Leia, in order to collect enough power to leave the dimension. How does this all work? Well, Waru apparently acquires energy to power his portal through the use of the Anti-Force. Another quote. What did it want from us? Leia asked. Waru whispered to my brother, she thought, and told him, tempted him. It was stranded, Luke said. His gaze was haunted. It could only gain energy by annihilating the force of our universe with the anti-force of its own. Waru needed enough power to rip a path through space-time back to its own universe, like an electron and a positron, bring them together, and he clapped his hands together. Annihilation. Unimaginable energy. He closed his eyes. Hithrir thought he'd be able to tap into that power, and for a moment, so did I. The domain from which Waru comes is apparently a polar opposite of the Star Wars dimension, including the Anti-Force, Luke's name for the power that governs that universe. So in a sense, Waru wasn't actually using the Force or destroying the Force to return home. Rather, it seemed to be the immense energy created by bringing the Anti-Force and the Force together in a single place. Waru's powers called out to Jedi across the galaxy, and he also used his powers as a healer to further attract visitors. So, how does this fit into the greater Star Wars Legends continuity? Well, it doesn't really, at least unless you take a closer look at the cancelled but unofficially released novella Supernatural Encounters of the Star Wars Universe, which we've brought up a few times over the past few videos. This work brings together several Legends concepts and creates basically a singular pocket dimension within the Star Wars Universe. I've taken a few quotes and sort of jammed them together in a way that tells the whole story. Shortly after they'd first arrived, Talotni, Splendid App, and Cold Danda Sign created a hidden realm within and beyond the galaxy in which they would not easily be discovered. 
It was the dimension later referred to as Other Space, a dreamlike, surrealistic pocket dimension hidden behind real space. The gloomy, charcoal canopy universe was touched with hints of a deep red glow, pinprick black stars, supernovas, and other rare celestial phenomenon that were scattered amongst the fewer standard variety suns, lending the dimension a truly alien feel. Though some came to call it Muspili, the Realm of Fire, and others the Anti-Force, it was named Ilatherion in a long forgotten language, which meant Veiled Fortress. Beyond the reach of real space and the walls of hyperspace, and occluded by powerful spells, Cold Danda Sign had envisioned contumacious new things to excite him, so that it became, over time, an even weirder and more hideous domain forged in mockery of the galaxy. So, Waru's realm, and the anti-force within it, is the same as Other Space, which we've been recently talking about, and was basically somewhere for Cold Dan Design, one of the four extraordinarily powerful Bedlam spirits, to experiment. Upon a journey to Other Space in the novella, Waru and creatures like him are encountered by the protagonist. Now, of course, none of this is canon, and of course, Star Wars Legends ended before this novella could be officially released, but it's interesting. Other Space is often described as the opposite of regular space, so having the anti-force within really makes sense. Having Waru and other strange and horrific creatures living there also helps explain why the Charon seemingly went mad. I think the best basic description of the Nell now actually comes from Hiding in Plain Sight, a 2014 article on StarWars.com. It states the following. Nell now are a mysterious entity from the unknown regions. On first glance, it looks like nothing more than a thick gray ooze, but has the ability to quickly mold parts of itself into a variety of forms. It possesses the ability to infect and control other beings. By exposing nearby individuals to a spray of droplets, it is able to enter their system, slowly digesting their victims and replacing their innards with the same gray ooze that makes up the parent. Interestingly, we see that the article refers to the Nal Nal, or just Nal Nal, as a mysterious entity. We'll talk more about this later. Let's also take a closer look at the source which first introduced the parasite, or creature, or being. The Unknown Regions RPG Guide, which gives us a full idea of their grotesque nature. The Nal Nal were a unique species in the Star Wars galaxy, truly one of a kind. Although technically one being, they appeared in numerous places, from single spores to deep lakes. Their most concentrated form was the planet Mug Fallow, a dead planet with internal grottos filled with the being. They are described as slimy and smelling like sweet rot. In their pure form, they often take the shape of stalks, eyes, mouths, or flying bat-like creatures. However, this is just the beginning. The Nal Nal attack living beings, attempting to enter their orifices while ripping apart droids or others wearing armor. Why do they do this? And what is its purpose? Well, it gets bad at this point. The Nal Nal enter a living host, eating away and replacing its innards with what is essentially black pus or goo. From here, they manipulate the being like a puppet. Although muscles, bones, and tissues have been destroyed, they move the shell of the living being in a primitive and grotesque fashion. Obviously, this isn't the most convincing fake. The body, for example, does not breathe, it does not blink, and speech is unnatural and distorted. Eventually, the body itself also decays. But more disturbing than their actions is their motivation. The Nell Nell claim to be ancient, all-knowing, having witnessed the rise and fall of countless galactic civilizations, and perhaps even influencing the celestials' shaping of the galaxy. They appeared first on Mug Fallow, perhaps from another dimension. This quote-unquote homeworld is ringed by dead spaceships from even ancient history, which they've collected, apparently only because they enjoy doing so. From Mug Fallow, they've made their way further into the unknown regions, and even towards the Rim. Other than destroying the infestation with fire, there is no known way to halt their advance. As I've explained, they progress by infecting others, from sentient beings to the most basic of creatures. The disease can be spread by a single drop within a drink, and a body can be hollowed out and replaced within a day. Now, it's unclear whether they actually use organic matter to feed on and reproduce, but due to the devastating, fast nature of the creature, it seems likely. The internal assault of the Nal Nal is obviously extraordinarily painful. Future victims are found as the pus zombie either dies and explodes, or lashes out, introducing the parasite to new targets. 
Often the Nell now will use tendrils or stalks as a way to primitively attack and transport itself to other beings. Every Nell Nell zombie, or rather every piece of the Nell Nell as the really one creature, can instantaneously communicate even across the galaxy with the rest of its being. Zombies are often thus synchronized in movement, and what's worse, the Nell Nell are pure evil. They are cosmic and strange and cruel. They tease mysteries of the universe while inflicting horrors on their victims, not because they need to, but because they enjoy it, just like they enjoy ringing their planets with the dead husks of starships. The guidebook explains a common tactic of reanimating dead children before their grieving parents. So we have a being bent on just being awful, probably from another galaxy or dimension, which can spread nearly at will, taking over the bodies of creatures or manifesting as stalks, mouths, etc. It's really just gross, but it's also a bit of Lovecraftian cosmic horror, which as a sci-fi and fantasy fan, I love. There's a couple more quotes I'd like to read before ending this video. Dan Wallace, who created the Unknown Regions Guide, which really fleshed out and introduced the Nell Nell, had some more ideas which didn't quite make it to the book. Here's some direct quotes. On its home planet, Nell Nell is a world ocean that shares with its visitors the whispered secrets of the galaxy's creation. Many treat the Nell Nell with superstition, many referring to it as the Rot God. There's quite a bit of HP Lovecraft behind the species. Quite unintentional is the fact that there's also a bit of Joe Schreiber's Death Trooper in there, namely the fact that a deadly infection can turn people into zombies. I didn't read Death Troopers until I had already finished the manuscript for the Unknown Regions, but at the last minute I was able to include a line which speculatively tied Nell Nell to developments under Imperial Project's Blackwing. Finally, he talks about the fact that Nell Nell perhaps being extra dimensional and being tied to shapeless beings from beyond known space with magical telepathic powers is a Waru reference from the Crystal Star. 